Just take a moment to close your eyes and begin to allow yourself to get comfortable and begin to drift off asleep. And as you begin to drift asleep, I'll just tell a story in the background. And it's a story about you waking up one morning and you wake up on a boat that's traveling around the world and you're on a cruise traveling from country to country and you've come on this cruise for a special occasion You're celebrating that special occasion. And you've come on this cruise alone to be able to find yourself, to be able to find a sense of peace, a sense of calm. To be able to focus on connecting with the world around you. To know that you're in control of your journey. That you can decide to do what you want to do as you learn from the experience. And so you walk up on the deck. Breathe in that sea air looking around, seeing sea all the way out to the horizon. And as you look in one direction, you can be curious about the way the sky and the sea match in their blueness. So much so that you can barely make out the point where the sky and the sea meet. And you look in another direction, you can see the way the sun glistens across the water. And in the distance you can see a humpback whale breaching, turning in the air, and splashing down on its back. And as you walk to the front of the boat, so you can notice a pod of dolphins riding the bow wave, jumping over each other, almost surfing along with the boat. And you're able to look down on them and voluntarily they're choosing to be there. And you're aware that that's not like when they're in captivity, made to do tricks, because people tell them what to do. They've got a whole ocean, and they've chosen to come to the boat, chosen to play. And at any point, they'll pull away and go off and do whatever they choose. And the boat's large enough that you barely notice any movement from passing over the waves. The biggest tell that you're moving is actually the breeze on your face. And you can breathe in that salty air, clearing your nose, breathing in, almost filling you with a sense of relaxation. Almost like you can breathe out any tension. And you find somewhere to sit near the front of the boat. You relax back. 
and from your perspective looking forward. You can almost have that sense like you're flying. Like you can see the horizon, you can see the ocean, you can see the sky. But you can only see a little bit of the boat. And the longer you gaze out at the horizon, the more you seem to stop being aware of that bit of the boat. In the same way that when you become absorbed watching a TV program, you stop being aware of the room you're sitting in. You just become totally absorbed with that program. And you just lie back, relaxing in that chair, gazing out to sea, feeling like you're flying. And as there's nothing stimulating in view, your eyes begin to get heavy. And they begin to do extended blinks. Almost like blinking with each out breath before those eyes totally shut. And then with your eyes shut, you start to become more aware of the sounds around you. The sound of the water beneath you as the boat pushes through. The sound of the motor, the sound of the breeze passing past your ears. And the distant sound of a seagull. And as you focus on that seagull, so you begin to have a sense of becoming that seagull, soaring over the ocean, flying up high, catching up drafts, circling around higher and higher in the sky, seeing further and further in all directions, diving down rapidly, swooping up, being able to fly so gracefully, And then as that seagull, you gaze up and see an aeroplane way, way up in the sky. And you know that as this seagull, you'd never be able to fly that high. But you imagine what it would be like to be up on that plane. And then as you find yourself on that plane, you can hear someone counting down three, two, one, jump. And then you look and see someone leaping out of the open side of the plane. And then you see the next person get three, two, one, jump. And then they just leap out of the plane. And you're curious about this experience. And you look down at your body and notice that you're wearing a parachute. And so you decide to have a go. You walk over. 
you get hooked onto a bar that's attached to the back of the parachute. It becomes your turn. The person at the door says three, two, one. And then jump. And you jump out the plane, spread your arms and legs. The parachute automatically opens behind you. And within just a few seconds, you feel that jolt as you decelerate with the open parachute and almost feel like you've risen up slightly when in fact you've just lowered down slower. And you look around and in the distance you can see some islands you can see clouds beneath you, clouds above you. You can feel the wind on your face. As you steer yourself down and feel like you're gliding and floating so gracefully so silently, so peacefully, and it begins to remind you of an experience of being in a hot air balloon. That experience of just floating over the land below, and in this case over the sea below so silently. And you see a circle of boats and you know that you need to head to land in that circle. And so you descend and you pull on one cord and pull on another to steer your way down, slowly, carefully, floating down through the air. And you see those that jumped before you, landing on target, one after the other. about a minute apart from each other, giving time for the previous person to move out the way. As you come down and splash land also, and as you land in the water, So, in your imagination, you suddenly realise that you've become a shark. That suddenly everything changes again. You feel that sense of your body moving side to side. And you notice the difference in the senses that you have as a shark. Noticing that you feel this kind of tingling and almost just have a bit like images but not images of things around you. And you notice that you're perceiving the electrical impulses, electrical fields of other fish swimming around. And you have this sense like you can see them, but it's almost like seeing a shadow.
and as a shark you dive down deeper, exploring the ocean, noticing being so streamlined, it doesn't take much of a flick of your tail to propel you down deeper into the ocean, noticing the way the light begins to fade as you go down deeper and deeper. And the deeper you go into the ocean, the calmer and slower moving everything seems to be, which helps to increase feelings of relaxation, peacefulness, And as you near the bottom of the ocean here, you begin to notice it being almost like white sand that moves and fluffs up in the movement of the water from each flick of your tail. And as you continue swimming along, so you begin to notice a distant sound of a horn. And you realize that the horn on the ship is sounding. And you begin to drift back from the reverie as you gaze out across the front of the boat and you notice that there's some land up ahead that's now come into view and as the boat arrives at the land so you disembark And you'll be spending a day on this island. And so you start to explore the island. Check yourself into the hotel. And as you explore the island, you find a river. And you follow that river up to a lake. And beyond the lake is a waterfall and above the waterfall, the river continues. And you climb up and you can see that that river continues all the way over to some mountains in the distance. And you wander around near the lake, hearing the sound of the waterfall, feeling some of the spray from the waterfall. And as you explore, so you become curious about something, that there are many trees around the outside of the lake that just seem to have marks on them or be totally chewed down. And you suspect that somewhere there are some beavers but you can't see any signs of them. And so you decide to explore, see if you can find them. And you head up above the waterfall. You follow that river, being aware of how calm that river's flowing. And as you follow that river, you reach a point where the river seems to divide into two. And one side seems to be calm, flowing slow. And the other side seems to be flowing faster. So you follow the calm side. 
heading in the direction of the mountains. And after some time of walking, you notice that there's a dam across the river. And you're surprised at how large this dam is. And that this dam is built by beavers. And you can see some of those beavers walking around near the dam, diving into the water. And then coming back, walking around again and getting back in the water, seeming to be hard at work. And as you walk around the dam, so you notice that a man-made dam further up the river seems to have cracked and crumbled And that if it wasn't for this dam created by the beavers, this water would have flooded all the way down to the village near the river, down near the sea. And that these beavers have probably saved that village. And yet, everyone at the village is completely unaware of this. And you don't know whether the beavers did that on purpose or whether it was just coincidence. And you head back the way you came. And you know that at the village you'll mention to somebody what you've seen so that hopefully the man-made dam can be fixed. and anything that needs to be done can be done. But you know those beavers have done a brilliant job. And that their dam would easily hold. And as you near the village after you've reported what you've seen, you wander off into the nearby woodland. You enjoy spending time away from all the other people. Time alone, time where you can reflect and focus on personal growth and development. And on looking after yourself because you're aware that people spend too much time focusing on trying to survive life. They miss the opportunity to focus on living life and on learning how to make the journey enjoyable. And so you've taken this opportunity to do so, to focus on yourself for a while. And so as you head into the woodland, you notice the sounds of woodland birds. Notice any village sounds disappearing in the distance sounds of the rustling leaves and of each footstep you take. And then deep in the woodland where the sun struggles to reach and just the occasional shard of light dances in front of you managing to creep its way through the branches and leaves overhead. A shard of light 
reflects off the back of something on the ground and that something then moves and catches your eye more and you notice that there's a white rabbit and it's hopping around munching some food and then hopping around some more And the old saying, follow the white rabbit, comes to mind. And so you decide to follow that white rabbit. And it turns off the track you're on. And effortlessly manages to get through the woods. Whereas you, as a full-sized human, has to push through branches and squeeze through. But you manage to keep up with that rabbit. And you have this sense that somehow that rabbit, you think, seems to know that you're following it. Because every time you struggle to push through, the rabbit seems to stop as if it's waiting to allow you to catch up. And when you're walking freely and easily, the rabbit seems to hop along faster. But you continue to follow that white rabbit. And then eventually you see that rabbit arrive at an area with a couple of rabbit holes. And it looks back at you. And then it looks at the holes. And then it looks back at you again. And then it looks at the holes again. And then it makes the decision of which hole to follow. And it jumps into one of the holes. And you instantly think there's no chance of you following it now. Because you obviously can't fit in a rabbit hole. But you decide that you'll go over and sit near the holes and wait near the holes and at some point the rabbit will come back and maybe it will let you pet it but as you go near those holes suddenly it's almost like a force seems to suddenly drag you into one of the holes like you got too close and suddenly fell in. And you find yourself almost teleported through one of those rabbit holes, the same one that white rabbit just took. And in almost like a flash, you find yourself in a strange place. You look around, there's a purple sky, there's a red sun, there's deep purple flowers with black leaves. An orange grass. At least these are the best descriptions that you could give to them. And you can see that white rabbit just sitting there, eating, 
some of that grass. And then you see a furry creature with legs that look a bit like frog's legs, leaping near the rabbit and jumping in some water. And then swimming across the water, jumping out the other side. And looking as dry as it did when it jumped in. You notice there's something odd about the fur of that animal. That seems to make it so that fur is water repellent. And you gaze up in the sky. because you think you can see some birds out the corner of your eye. And instead, the best you could describe is that they look a bit like pterodactyls, circling overhead. And then up on a rock, you see the cutest little creature that's barely bigger than your hand. When it opens its mouth, it seems to make a squeak, that kind of squeak that some kittens make. When you find it so cute, you go over to investigate it further. And you start petting that unusual, green, lizardy looking creature that has the biggest eyes, almost like puppy dog eyes. And as you pet it, suddenly you jump back a bit startled because instead of purring like maybe a cat would once it seems to enjoy the petting suddenly a flame came out its mouth as it opened its mouth and it wasn't a big flame or a scary flame but it was unexpected But it doesn't react beyond just having that flame come out its mouth, almost like burping a flame. And so you carry on petting it, but make a bit of a mental note not to have it facing you while you're doing this. And then it climbs up onto your other arm and rests on your lap as you carry on petting it. And you can feel it vibrating slightly. Similar to how cats vibrate as they purr. And it seems to really like you. And you decide you want to continue exploring this area. Exploring this strange place you've ended up. And so you go to put that little dragon creature back down. But as you put it down on the rock, so it just jumps up on your arm, climbs up onto your shoulder. And so you take it down off your shoulder, put it back on the rock. And it just jumps up again, climbs up on your shoulder. And then it nuzzles its head against the side of your neck and gently rubs you, making a slight purring sound, a slight squeaky sound. And so you decide that you'll explore, but you suppose you're going to have to keep that on your shoulder for now. 
because it seems to like you. And so as you continue to explore this land, you notice that there's a low kind of hum to this land. You don't quite know what it is, but it seems to be a bit like the sound of wind, but a much deeper, quieter, more distant sounding sound. You notice that you feel a bit lighter here as you walk around. And that there's something unusual about the colours of everything. Many of the colours are much darker. And the sun is much redder. And it's unusual having a purple sky. And then as you walk into some trees, you notice that two of the trees seem to move. And then realize that their long legs a little bit like legs of a giant bird. But as you get closer and look, it's almost like bird legs attached to a lizard or a dinosaur's body. with a strangely long neck and a small head that seems to be allowing it to eat from the tops of these tall trees. And you can see some tiny bird-like creatures that seem to be perched on its head and landing on its body. And then they would fly off its head and off its body into the space beneath the leaves whereas this creature pulled on the leaves small little bits would fall off perhaps almost like little tiny bits of fruit and the birds would quickly dive off and catch those little bits midair and then land back on this creature again. And this creature didn't seem to mind them being there. It was as if everyone has their niche. And nothing was really paying attention to them being there to you walking around. You seem to be able to just walk around almost unnoticed with everything around you just carrying on its day as if you weren't even there. And a part of you is still curious how you got here. What that rabbit hole was. Why you had that feeling of following the white rabbit. And you continue to explore this land. This strange alien world. And you can see what looks like a cave entrance in the distance. So you decide to head towards that cave. Explore the cave. 
and as you near the cave. So you see what looks like a floating robot that seems to be just hovering and moving and looks like it almost has small jets around its body but they're not combustion jets but you can't tell what they are they just seem to glow possibly a bit like plasma but you also know it isn't plasma you can't feel any heat from it and you can get very close to this robot and it's almost like it's got arms and it looks like it has a face even though it probably doesn't have a need for a face and you wonder who built this robot where it came from and you're curious about the fact that people have a tendency and perhaps even other aliens have a tendency for wanting things to look familiar. And all animals will have mouths, will have sensory organs, and likely to survive. All animals will have stereoscopic senses so that they can pinpoint different things in the space around them and react accordingly and so it makes sense that an advanced civilization would probably have these and would probably design a robot to vaguely resemble what looks familiar and the robot talks to you as if it just happened to know your language. And this takes you by surprise. But at the same time, the whole experience is weird. So you just go with the flow. Treat it as part of your journey. The robot asks, do you want me to light the way and you ask what way and the robot says do you want me to light the cave and so you agree that that would be a nice thing that would be helpful and you start walking towards the cave And as you head towards the cave, so the robot almost silently seems to glide along with you and head into the cave with you. And then its eyes seem to light the way. And as you walk into the cave, So you can notice how the sound changes. And for the first time on this planet, you feel a sense of familiarity. The sound of water dripping in one cave seems to sound pretty similar to water dripping in another. The sound of your footsteps in this cave has a familiar sound of footsteps in a cave. And that robot lights the way. And its eyes light up. A very wide beam of light. Lighting the walls and off into the distance. And you're surprised at how long this cave seems to be. 
and she walked deeper and deeper into the cave. And as you walk deeper into the cave, so you begin to notice some drawings on the walls. And signs that you're not the first person to have been here, or the first intelligent being to have been here. And you start asking the robot where they came from. And they explain how they were made by a civilization many, many years ago. And that civilization has long since left this world. And they'd left a handful of robots on the planet to continue to watch over the planet, to continue to monitor that planet. And they'd created the ability to leap from place to place. And from what the robot described, it sounded almost like they'd created the ability to leap through wormholes. But they seemed to be able to open these wormholes and create permanent wormholes without the need for physical technology in that location. And you were curious whether maybe that rabbit hole was one of these wormholes. And maybe that ancient civilization from this planet had visited Earth. And you're curious what other planets they may have visited. So you continue to explore in the cave, talking with that robot, asking more questions, deeply curious about the answers. And as you walked deeper into the cave, so you noticed that it seems to be opening up into a vast cavern And then you see, just barely being lit up, what looks like an ancient temple deep here in this cavern. And you decide to go and explore that temple. And you walk all the way up to the temple And you run your hands around the stonework and notice that stone feels so cool under your fingertips. And it's been so smoothly made and you can't see an entrance. So you walk your way around that temple, working your way around the temple, running your hand around the walls. And then at one point that robot just stops as you continue running your hand around the outside of that temple. And then after a little while you notice that you're walking out of the light and that the robot's no longer travelling with you. And so you head back to where that robot is and you ask them why they've stopped. And they just respond saying, we're here. And you ask where? And they say, we're at the temple. We're at the entrance. 
we're here. And you look in front of you. And it looks no different to anywhere else around here. It just looks like solid stone. And you ask, how do I get in? And the robot explains that you just have to find the right spot. And so you continue to run your hands around that stone. And then eventually you find just the tiniest, almost like some dust on the stone, or of the tiniest bit of gravel on the stone. And it's only because you're running your hands over it, and obviously your fingertips are so sensitive, that you notice that, and you apply just the slightest pressure in that place. And then the stone wall suddenly shoots to the side almost like a very fast door opening that seems to move out the way faster than you could imagine such heavy stone moving and you see this perfectly formed entrance into the temple just so perfectly carved and you walk into the temple with the robot following you. You can see your shadow extending out in front of you as the lights from the robot behind you shine on your back. And then you turn a corner in this temple and see what looks like just a dead end and you turn to the robot and you say this is just a dead end what's supposed to be in this temple if that was the entrance I thought there would be something here and the robot said there is something here you just have to hear it and so you close your eyes and relax and listen And you can hear that same windy, low rumble that you could hear before. Except now it sounds a little bit louder and a little bit closer. And with your eyes closed, just listening, you realize that you can almost hear it through your feet as if that sound is actually travelling through the ground. And you suddenly have this feeling of confidence, this feeling like you understand. And you open your eyes and begin to confidently walk towards that wall. And as you arrive at that wall, so you feel that same experience you had at the rabbit hole. Almost like you're just falling through the wall, as if that wall's not even there. And you find yourself inside another stone structure. And just after you find yourself in that stone structure, so the robot seems to be behind you again, having followed you through that portal, lighting your way in this structure. And you find your way through this structure. 
you find a narrow path to follow. And you follow that narrow path. And then you find what looks almost like a spacesuit. And it's not quite like any spacesuit you've seen before. Definitely not like an Earth spacesuit. But you can recognize that it looks like it's designed to protect you in space. And the robot says that you should put that suit on. And you wonder why. And you wonder how. Because the suit definitely doesn't look like it's made for humans. And the robot says, put the helmet on your head. And so you pick up the helmet and you put that on your head. And as you do, so the suit seems to leap off the wall and build itself around you, starting at the base of the helmet. Almost like some kind of strange nanotechnology fitting it perfectly to you wearing that suit. And as it gets down near your feet, the robot guides you to lift up one foot and then lift up the other. And as you lift one foot, the suit builds around the sole of your foot. And then you lift up the other foot and it does the same the other side. And you find yourself fully wearing that spacesuit. And then that robot says, let's go. And you wonder where. And then suddenly a doorway opens up in front of you. And you look out that door and you can just see what you know to be a Martian-like landscape. And you've seen enough images of Mars to recognize that if you were here, this is what it would look like. With the slight red tinge to the sky. The tiny sun in the sky, reasonably dim up there. And you walk out onto this landscape. You turn around. And you see that you've just walked out of what looks like. A weathered pyramid. Like a pyramid that's been here for so long. That the wind has weathered it down. To make it almost look like just normal rock formations, but you've just been inside there, so you know it isn't. And you walk and turn around to get as good a perspective as you can on it. And you realize you're now just walking on the surface of Mars, looking back at a pyramid here on Mars. And you know that for years people on Earth have been talking about aliens coming from Mars, about canals on Mars, about life on Mars. And here you are on Mars, aware that at some point in the past this seems to have been true. But you don't know what purpose these aliens would have had with building pyramids here on Mars. 
you can understand why they might want to go to Earth. But why would they come here to Mars? And then you see some movement on the ground. And you notice what looks a little bit like rats scampering around, just the cutest rats you've ever seen. But they look just slightly different. And somehow they're surviving here. Not that far from the pyramid. And you notice how they seem to be coming out and then scampering back towards that pyramid. And so you wonder whether they live somehow between these different portals and the locations of the portals. And all you can think is these are space rats. And you almost make yourself laugh a bit, suddenly imagining rats in space, thinking it's the most ridiculous thing. You've come on a journey, on a cruise, and now you're stood on Mars, watching rats scampering around, just being the cutest little things. And that robot's still with you as you explore a little bit on Mars. And as the Martian sun sets, so you notice off in the distance among the stars, this pale blue star. And you realize that you're staring at the Earth that somewhere over there is the ship you're on, docked up at the island you're on. And now you're here. And many, many, many hours have passed. And you wonder whether anyone would even notice that you haven't been in that village, you haven't mixed with anyone, that you're even not around at the moment. And so you ask the robot, what am I doing here? Where should I go now? And the robot says to come this way and begins to lead you off down into a valley. And you head down into that valley as it's getting dark here on the Martian surface. And you notice there's another dead end and you realize that that dead end is bound to also be another portal and the robot explains that many of the portals are near each other and that you can actually get a map of where the different portals go. So that you can traverse the galaxy from one planet to another. Just knowing which combination of portals to walk through. And you think to yourself, mind blown, how you've just come on this strange adventure. Something that totally changes people's perception on reality, their place in the universe. Knowing that once there was this deeply advanced civilization that may still be around somewhere, but may well have progressed 
long beyond here. And so you decide to head through wherever this is going to lead. And wearing that space suit, you walk through that wall and come out the other side. And you turn around to wait for the robot to follow you. And as that robot follows you, you notice that they are exiting a picture with the most beautiful golden picture frame. And that you seem to now be in some kind of a palace with marble floors that echo with each footstep. And the robot says it's okay to take off that helmet now. And so you remove that. And then suddenly all that nanotech suit undoes from around you. And gathers inside the helmet. And then you hear this squeaking sound and see the little dragon creature pop itself out of your top pocket as if to say that it's not been happy stuck in there under this suit all this time as it climbs back up onto your shoulder and you begin to explore this palace. And as you explore, so you can notice that smell of water. And so you walk around this area. And you realize that it seems vaguely familiar. Not familiar in terms of somewhere you've been before. But familiar in terms of something you've learned about before. And you realize that it seems to be some kind of Roman or Greek baths. And you can hear the sounds of people here. And so you try to keep yourself out of sight. And you can see people with robes on and just towels around them. Going and getting into the baths. And just socialising and chatting and relaxing in that steaming warm water. And you wonder where you are. And you ask the robot. And the robot says it's not so much about where you are now. It's more about when you are. Because the wormholes, these portals, are dotted all over. But the entrances and exits lead to the time differences of when they were placed. So you connect one with another. And they're connected in time as well as space. And when you are here, is hundreds of years before 
when you were last here. And you realize this is way back in the past. And that's even more reason to remain out of sight. Because you don't want any strange stories starting about someone appearing out of nowhere, seemingly with magical powers. and seemingly with a floating robot they wouldn't understand. And you leave these baths to explore outside. And you recognize it as some kind of European countryside. And stood near the baths is the most beautiful white horse. And you climb up onto the back of that white horse and decide to go on just a little explore. Because you wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to explore the past for real. And you canter off on that horse with the robot travelling alongside you, that dragon up on your shoulder. Heading into dense woodland. And you can notice through that woodland a lake in the distance. And you decide to head towards that lake. And the sun here is almost fully set as you pass through that woodland. And as you leave the woodland at the lake and dismount the horse, you can notice the green lights of fireflies in the sky. And then you notice the most strangest thing. You notice a fairy fly down, land on the back of the horse. And this fairy somehow seems to be able to communicate with you. And the fairy begins to tell you that somewhere here there's a secret location that it had been rumoured a traveller from the future would come and find and that you look out of place and so you must be that traveller. And as that fairy continues to talk to you, so the fireflies fly down and join that fairy. And then the most beautiful butterflies you've ever seen land on the horse's back, slowly opening and closing their wings. And then some ladybirds land on the horse's back. And then you notice some rabbits coming out from the forest, coming out from that woodland, coming over to the horse. And some badgers. And so many of these creatures seem to be coming over. 
as if somehow they think there's something about you that they're drawn to. How somehow you seem to resonate with them. And you have this sense that there's consciousness in each and every one of those living creatures. And you start to realize that it's all too easy in everyday life to focus on humans perhaps being the pinnacle of advancement and consciousness and almost dismissing animals as being second rate and not respecting them as living beings. And here they are, demonstrating their individuality, their consciousness. Demonstrating that they have as much right to be around and live as anyone else. And a part of you seems to almost connect with this, with this idea of everything being connected. And you decide that you'll follow this fairy and explore whatever it is that they're taking you towards. And you have this sense almost like you seem to have an entourage now. You've got this dragon on your shoulder, a floating robot, and now all of these animals traveling with you, and a fairy. And as you walk around this lake following that fairy, the fairy takes you to what looks like a bit of a run-down house, almost like just a shack with white walls and a wooden door. And everything stops outside that shack. And the fairy says only you can enter. And the dragon jumps down off your shoulder. And you enter that shack. And as you enter, so you realize that you're in a vast room. And you're taken aback by this. So you leave that shack a minute. You look around the outside of the shack and you very easily and quickly walk around the outside and decide that it's best to just accept what's going on. And so you enter that shack again, enter that vast room. You walk across that vast room and find a door you walk through that door and find a room full of doors. And you try each door and every door you walk through just seems to be another room full of even more doors. And eventually you find a room that seems to have no doors. So you enter that room, thinking that's the one that stands out as being different. And in this room, you can just see three paintings. One on the back wall, one on the wall to the left, and one on the wall to the right. But no other doors. And so you walk and slowly look at each painting. 
you look at a painting of a lighthouse. You walk around the floor to the next painting. In that painting, you see the ocean and an island. And then walk around to the next painting. And at that painting, you see a sunset over the ocean. And then you go and stand in the middle of the room, trying to work out what all these paintings mean. And then you have this insight, given the way things have been going. Maybe these paintings are portals. And so you walk to that first painting. You reach out your hand, go to touch that painting with your fingertips. Your fingertips pass straight through the painting. And so you step through that painting finding yourself on a cliff near a lighthouse and a bench and the sound of seabirds, the crashing sound of the water below the cliff and see that light as it scans out to sea. And you walk over to the bench. You sit on the bench, look out to sea, wondering why you're here. You've been led here by a fairy and told that only you can get what's here. And you explore the lighthouse. And in the lighthouse you find a small chest, and in that chest you find a tiny key. And so you wonder whether that key is important. And if it isn't, you know you can always return it. But everything here looks like it's meant to be here, apart from this box and this key. So you take that key and you head back and step out of that painting and then step into the next painting and in that painting you just explore a little bit but you can't find anything here and don't even really know where here is so you leave that painting and go through the third painting and in this third painting, as the sun setting, you see what looks like a treasure chest on the beach. And you know it's a long shot. But you decide to use that key. And you wonder why, if this treasure chest has been here for a long time, no one's taken it or opened it before. And you decide to try and move that treasure chest and realize it doesn't move. It seems to be stuck in place. And so you assume that maybe that's why it's always been here. Maybe people have tried for years to move that treasure chest and they failed and maybe as time's gone on people have forgotten about this treasure chest and you look around you and realize you're on an island what looks like a deserted island a small island with just sea in every direction 
as far as you can see. And you use that key to open that chest. And the lid pops open. And inside you see a glowing crystal. And as you reach in and touch that crystal, so you feel a deep sense of peace and calm. And you feel like the knowledge of that ancient race of aliens is transmitted through that crystal, almost like it's transmitted through the energy or the vibrations from that crystal, through your hand, almost like that energy transmits that energy up through your arm and into your brain. And you start having flashes in your mind of that alien race, of their technology, of their achievements. Almost like you start to see the network of portals throughout the galaxy and how those portals are positioned in time throughout the galaxy. As if somehow you've been led to here to be the one to continue this knowledge on or to start this knowledge afresh to understand something deeper about your reality. And you take that crystal with you, leave that painting, and you head out, finding your way out of that shack, seeing all those animals still standing there, And the fairy smiles and says, you've got what you came for. And you get back on the horse. The dragon gets back on your shoulder. And you head back through finding your way back to where you came from. And the robot comes with you as you head back through those baths, back on Mars, back to that cave, and eventually out of the rabbit hole. And as you come out the rabbit hole, so you notice that now the sun has set and you feel so exhausted for the journey you've been on and you feel in your pocket and realise you've still got that crystal, that everything you've experienced was real, that this wasn't a dream. And you decide to sit down by a lake. You decide just to rest for a little bit. Because in the morning, you've got to continue with your cruise. And you rest there, gazing up into the sky. Being aware of the stars twinkling. Looking up at the moon. And as you look up towards the moon, so you can see a tiny dot moving across the sky. And as that tiny dot moves in front of the moon, you wonder whether that was the space station. And as you wonder, you close your eyes with your eyes closed, you 
begin to have this sense of floating and drifting and being in space, in that space station, looking out of the windows down on the earth, watching as the planet moves by beneath you. Enjoying that weightless feeling, aware that it's a bit like that feeling when you jumped out of the plane. Aware that your hair feels unusual, as there's no gravity to hold it in place. And thinking to yourself that it's strange how people think that in space there's no gravity, when in reality it's just that you're falling to earth and you keep missing the planet. And that gravity is forever dragging the space station to earth, but it's travelling so fast. You're just spinning around and around every 90 minutes or so around the planet. And that that gives the sensation of weightlessness. And then you Find yourself back thinking about being at that lake, hearing the gentle water on the shore just lapping near your feet, noticing the way the moon twinkles on the surface of that lake, the occasional sound of birds in the woodland. as you find your way back to a hotel you're staying in. And head up to your room, into bed. And relax down. And drift and float. Asleep, knowing that you can continue your journey around the world, continue your cruise in the morning, curious whether every stop is going to have adventures like these, but knowing that you know now where all the portals are on earth and how they connect through the whole galaxy and time. And with that thought, you drift deeper and deeper asleep. Take a moment to get yourself comfortable and allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, you can hear the sound of my voice in the background. And as you listen to the sound of my voice, I'm just going to tell a story. And I don't know whether you'll drift deeper asleep to the sound of my voice or perhaps the spaces between my words. And as you drift asleep, you can just imagine yourself walking along a cliff top. And as you walk along that cliff top, you can gaze out to sea. And as you gaze out to sea, you can notice way off in the distance is the tail end of a passing storm. You can see the way the rain is falling into the sea, way over on the horizon. 
see the occasional silent flashes of lightning in the clouds. As those clouds continue to drift further and further away over the horizon. And you can notice what that sea looks like from up here on the cliff. Perhaps noticing the white water on the tops of the waves as they roll in towards the shore. Maybe even hearing the waves down on the shore below. And noticing some seabirds. perhaps noisily flying in the sky, having their first flight after the storm. And as you walk along that cliff top, you can head towards the lighthouse. And when you reach the lighthouse, you can notice the way that light beams out to sea, swings around the sea, and then pushes out again, circling around and around. And you can walk up to the door of the lighthouse hear the sound of that door as you open it and walk inside and you can notice what the furniture is like in here there's always that curiosity of how someone will place the furniture in a lighthouse with curved walls and notice the thickness of those walls of the window sills, how deeply set in those windows are, and you can see that there's a hatch leading down under the lighthouse, and you can be curious about what's down there, but for now decide to ascend decide to follow that spiral staircase all the way up to the top of the lighthouse. Walking around that spiral staircase, going higher and higher up that lighthouse. And at the top of the lighthouse is a hatch that leads up to the light. You can open that hatch and climb up into the room with the light. And walk over to the window and stand looking out to sea, aware of how high up you are up here. And as that light continues to turn, you feel the warmth of that light on the back of your neck as it passes by you and you see your shadow stretched across the sea. And from up here, you can see that storm going off in the distance. And then you notice, way off on the horizon, almost like a light flashing back. And you don't know whether it's a boat or whether from this height you're able to see the shore of some land a long way away. 
and you climb back down from this light. Go down the staircase. And when you're back on the ground floor, you decide to open that hatch and see what's under this lighthouse. And you know you're up high on a cliff. And so you wonder whether this hatch leads down into the cliff. And you open the hatch. And you see a shaft beneath that hatch. And a ladder. And you follow that ladder. Down deeper under the lighthouse. And you feel like you're descending for such a long time. So long that you start getting curious about when you're going to reach the bottom. And the whole time you're descending, the light above you gets further and further away. And everything around you gets darker and darker. And eventually you start to hear the distant echoey sound of the occasional drop in what sounds like an echoey cave. And then you finally reach the ground. And you see next to you on the ground with the light on a mobile phone. There are some matches and some candles and so you, you make a torch with those candles. You light a candle and you notice the way the flickering flame of a candle dances it's light on the walls, shadows moving, the smell of that candle flame. And you notice there seems to be a bit of a breeze down here from somewhere, the way that flame dances in your hand. And as you walk down this corridor, you notice it looks like it's been hand cut. Like someone's just been down here with a pickaxe, hacking away, creating this space. And you see at regular intervals what looks like lights on the walls to be lit by the flame from the candle. And as you light each one with the flame, so a little bit more area glows to life. And you start to see more and more of this space. And you're curious how deep you are, whether you descended beyond the depth of the cliff, or whether you're just within the cliff. And you wonder why someone dug this space out. And as you continue exploring, so the sounds of dripping water increases and then you start hearing just a distant faint rumble and you continue walking through the cavern walking down different corridors different tunnels exploring other caverns 
lighting the lights as you go. And that rumbling sound increases. And eventually you find yourself in a vast cavern that seems to have a river flowing through it. It seems to be quite a wide river. That's just creating a low rumble as water from a waterfall pours in at one end. And as the rivers wide, so the rivers reasonably slow moving. And you see, tied to the shore, is a rowboat. And you decide to explore. You've come this far. So you decide to get into that rowboat and explore. So you untie it from the shore. Use an oar to push off from the side. You hear that sloshing around the boat. You climb into the boat, feel the rocking as you get in, get settled in that boat. Pushing away from the shore. And then using the oars to direct yourself and to gently push yourself along the river. And you don't have to do much pushing. It's more just steering, keep yourself on track. And you still have that candle, which you've rested down in a gap that seemed to be designed specifically to hold a candle at the front of the boat. And as you head out of the cavern, following that river, So the ceiling of this cavern seems lower and you enter what seems like a channel created just by the flow of this water and the water speeds up slightly. You can see the way the light flickers around the walls on the ceiling and occasionally that water sprays up a little bit splashing on the boat splashing against the walls and you notice it has a salty smell and you realize that this river must be seawater that's flowed in here somehow. And then all of a sudden, that water begins to speed up. And the boat begins to speed up. And you feel yourself pushed back slightly in that rowboat with the acceleration. And then it feels almost like you're on a water ride. Suddenly it becomes more steep. And you feel like you're dropping down, following that water. As it seems to go steeply down. Before after quite a while, starting to straighten out more again. It seems to have a few turns, a few twists. And use the oars to reduce the amount you knock into the sides. Before ending up 
in another larger space, with calmer water again. And you try and look around you, see where you are. And you can't really see much, just that faint glow on the cave walls. And you notice that you're gradually drifting towards another tunnel. And this one turns out to be steeper than the last. And you feel perfectly fine, perfectly safe. But you feel like you should just hang on a little bit. And go with the flow. And the next time it comes out to another underground lake. You notice something different about this area. that it's much colder than where you left. And you notice the boat seems to be moving through the water, almost as if that water has become a little bit more syrup-like, a little bit thicker. And you put your hands into the water. And you feel how cold that water is. And now the breeze down here has increased significantly to what it was like when you entered this area, when you came underground. And you pull the boat over to the side. You tie the boat to a rock. You climb out of that boat and you see a tunnel to follow. And you walk down that tunnel. And although this has felt like a long ride, you're curious how far you've come for it to be so cold and where you've ended up. And you start to hear a howling wind sound. And you find your way down a cave. And you see a light at the end of the tunnel. And you head towards that light. And you notice as you start getting closer To that light, that everything outside that light is white. And the closer that you get, the more you realize that it's snow. And you find yourself coming out in a snowy environment. And you can see a little way in the distance is a log cabin and it doesn't look like there's any lights on in the log cabin it doesn't look like there's anybody there but you decide you want to get yourself warm and try and figure out where you are and so you push through that snow towards the log cabin, pushing your feet through the snow, crunching on snow, walking through higher bits of powdery snow, having to push through some trees and the branches and the snow falling off those branches and that cold wind on your cheeks. And eventually you reach that cabin. You open the door, enter the cabin, close that door behind you, and notice the sudden drop in sound of that wind. 
and the first thing you do is find a way to warm yourself up. You see that there's some wood and there's a log fire. And you put wood in the fireplace. You start yourself a fire. You then go through to the bedroom. You notice there's loads of incredibly fluffy blankets. The softest blankets you could find. And you wrap a couple of blankets around you. Almost like those blankets are giving you a hug. And you feel that warmth. And before doing anything else, you go and sit in a chair, an incredibly comfortable chair, by that log fire. And you relax in that chair wrapped in blankets. And you just calm down your breathing and relax and just watch the fire, watch the way the flames dance in the fireplace, hear that crackling, feeling the warmth of that fire on your cheeks, the warmth of the fire warming your legs. And your feet and your hands. And feeling more comfortable as you relax in front of that fire. And after you've warmed up, you decide to take a moment to see if there's anything to eat. And you find a tin of carrots. You find a bag of marshmallows. But you don't find much else here. And so you open the tin of carrots. You cook the carrots and you just eat them as they are. But the thing you're looking forward to is the marshmallows. And you go back to your seat. And you have a poker. And you just sit next to the fire. And while you relax, you take marshmallows one at a time heating it up and then eating it and relaxing then heating another one up and then eating it almost drifting into your own little world in your mind while you just heat marshmallows and eat them until you decide that perhaps you should be more productive. This is, after all, a strange experience. Because you don't know where you are and how a simple tunnel could f transport you here. And so you start searching the cabin to try and figure out where you are. And you can't find any immediate clues. And so you look out the window to see if outside there are any clues. And then you notice that there's a polar bear and a polar bear cub just walking through the woods, through the trees. and heading out into the snow.
And do you think that's a curious sight, given that a little while ago you were stood in a lighthouse on a cliff? And you wonder whether that's a clue as to where you are. And the sky is blue. It's quite windy, but the sky is blue. And you notice the sun's beginning to set. And so you think when you see the stars, perhaps you'll recognize where you are. And as the sun begins to set, and you wait for that sun to set, you find yourself waiting and waiting. And the longer you wait, the more that sun seems to be rising again. And you notice that for some reason here, the sun isn't setting. It's reaching a sunset, but then it's turning into a sunrise. And you decide that you're going to get a good night's sleep. And you can go and explore in the morning. And so you take all those blankets to the bedroom. You make yourself the coziest, most comfortable bed you can. You wrap yourself up in that bed. And close your eyes. And drift and float comfortably asleep. And while you sleep, you begin to dream. And it doesn't surprise you that your dreams are a little unusual, given that your experience is a little unusual. Find yourself walking through a forest. And you notice there's something unusual about the plants here. They have these enormous leaves. And you watch as a squirrel climbs a tree. You watch the way it leaps from one tree to another. and then scampers its way around the trunk of a tree, pausing part way round, its legs stretched out, and then scampering around some more, high up into the tree. And as you watch that squirrel, so you hear thuds in the background. You can feel the ground shaking beneath your feet with each thud. You wonder whether there's a pile driver somewhere, perhaps trying to drive something into a deep hole. You decide to explore, to find out. And when you go to explore, suddenly you see what looks like a tree trunk lift off the ground, move forward, and then thud back down again, followed by what looks like another tree trunk and another and another. And then you notice even more and you follow those tree trunks up with your eyes and you realize that they're the legs of enormous dinosaur. And you look out towards the heads of the dinosaur 
and you see that they seem to be sweeping their heads from side to side. Clearing the area around them of vegetation in arcs around their heads. They seem to have their necks stretched out and they eat some food and then they move their head along slightly, they eat some more food and they do that until they've moved their head all the way from one side across to the other and then they take a step so they can reach some more vegetation and they do the same again and you perhaps think to yourself that you thought that these dinosaurs with these long necks would be reaching up high into canopies of trees eating the leaves from high up in trees, imagining it would be a bit like watching giraffe eating. But instead they seem to be sweeping their heads from side to side, just slowly eating what's in front of their head then eating a bit further along, a bit further along. And this was behaviour you weren't expecting to see. And you wonder if there are these dinosaurs, what else is perhaps here? And you also wonder whether these dinosaurs would notice if you climbed up on their back. You felt that might help you to get a better view of things. And so you walk to the back end of one of the dinosaurs. You climb up on its tail while it's feeding. And you follow its tail up to its back. And it doesn't seem to notice you at all. You suspect that perhaps it doesn't have a lot of feeling for subtleties like a small creature like you climbing on it. And you look around and you realise that this is some kind of prehistoric land. And that it looks totally different to the kind of land you're used to, yet it has a certain familiarity. And you see off in the distance something twinkle or shine like a light in the distance. And you decide that's the place to go and explore. That will perhaps give you answers about this dream and you're aware that this dream feels so lucid and so real. You're so aware that you're aware that you're actually fast asleep in a cabin. And so you climb down from the dinosaur. You dodge around and between the dinosaurs. As you run out of this area in the direction of that light. And you push on through different vegetation, hearing different sounds of unfamiliar animals. Eventually, hearing an electrical buzzing sound. And then seeing what looks like a blue portal, almost like it's got lightning or electricity buzzing around it and being sucked 
into the sides of it, creating a tunnel in space and time. And you decide that in this dream, you're going to go through that portal and see where it leads. And so you run and you jump through that portal. And you find yourself landing on the softest sand. On the most beautiful beach. With water gently lapping on a shore. And you see, on the shore, just where the water meets the shore, that there's a bottle that seems to just be washed up and back on the shore, just bobbing onto the sand, being pulled a little way back out to sea, then being washed back onto the sand. And you pick up that bottle you find that there's a message inside the bottle. And you take the paper out of the bottle. And it looks like it could have been written yesterday. But you notice that there's a date in the top corner that shows it was actually written hundreds of years earlier. And that it talks about a ship carrying treasures. And that the ship is in trouble. And you wonder what happened to that ship. And you see there's coordinates. And the coordinates aren't too far. And the map that's scribbled onto this note shows that it isn't too far, if it's correct, to get to where that ship last was. And you don't know what happened, whether anything would be where that ship was at the point of the bottle being thrown overboard. But you decide to explore anyway. And you see that there's a rowboat up on the beach. You take that rowboat down to the water. And you row out to sea. Over the waves by the shore. And then you look down. Into that clear water. And you can see what looks like a wreck down there. And it doesn't look too far down. That it had hit rocks near enough to the shore. And that at the time it hit those rocks, perhaps they didn't realise how close to the shore they were. There's obviously no lighthouses around here. And so you decide to dive down. The water's really calm. So you decide to dive down, taking a deep breath. Being in a deeply relaxed state. And exploring and seeing if you can find what's down there. And you dive down and notice how, once you're underwater, sound changes, softens, deepens. Time seems to slow right down. As you swim down deeper and deeper. And you see a chest on the sea floor just inside the wreck of the boat. And it's only a small chest, but you decide to 
grab hold of that chest, push off the bottom and swim up to the surface. You place that chest in your rowboat. You then go round to the back of the rowboat, pulling yourself up and over the back of the rowboat. As the rowboat gently turns in the water and bobs up and down. And you row back towards the shore. And back at the shore, you open that chest. Curious what will be in there. And as you open that chest, you find a crystal. And you hold that crystal, and you're sure you can feel energy coming from the crystal. And this whole experience feels surprisingly lucid. And you feel that this crystal somehow has meaning. And you close that chest. Keeping hold of the crystal. And as you do. So you start to hear sounds of robins. And sounds of other birds. And you find yourself awakening in that cabin. And you find that there are bird sounds that you're familiar with, even though you're in an unfamiliar place. And you don't know where those sounds are coming from. It's almost like it was a natural alarm clock just telling you it was time to come back from that dream. And you notice that that crystal is sitting beside you on the side table next to the bed. And you start trying to think whether that crystal was always there. And that's why you dreamt it, or whether somehow you took that crystal out of your dream. And you pick the crystal up and you decide to take that with you. As you explore this area, you know you have to watch out for the polar bears. So you keep an eye out for them. You look around before leaving the cabin. And you head into the woods, head into the trees. And you see an unusual sight. You see a squirrel climbing the trees, jumping from one tree to another, and with each landing, a puff of snow falls from the tree. And then you see that squirrel in a tree. And see it bashing a nut or some kind of object. And then eating what it's just broken into. And you notice that it seems to be using tools. And you admire how intelligent the squirrels seem to be. And you wonder what other animals are around here that you can't see. And you can't stop here 
to drift into a meditation to find out. So you just continue to explore. And while you explore, you notice footprints in the snow. And you realize they look like human footprints. So you decide to follow those footprints, see who else is here. And you follow those footprints through the trees coming out near some cliffs. And you keep following those footprints. And then you find a cave and you see there's a fire lit in the cave. And you notice someone sat cross-legged by that fire. And they're just chanting to themselves with their eyes closed so focused on just chanting, almost seemingly unaware of your arrival. And you sit down cross-legged the other side of the fire, waiting for them to be aware of you. And you have this sense that they are aware of you, but what they're doing is more important to them than acknowledging your presence. And you find something about their chanting, almost hypnotic, almost seeming to draw you in, especially with the flickering of the fire between you, and that sound of the wind just outside the cave, the way that wind seems to whistle slightly as it blows past the cave. And eventually, that person opens their eyes and they say that you found a crystal on a beach and that crystal belongs here and you'll know where when you go there and you felt this was a little cryptic and you asked for more information and they just repeated the same thing. You found a crystal here. And they tell you the same information that still makes little sense. And eventually, when you've asked three or four times, they tell you to go and explore the cave. And as they tell you to explore the cave, you hear the dripping of the water off of the icicles hanging in the cave entrance. And they draw your attention more so to that dripping. And they tell you to grab some water first. And they offer you a pot and tell you to stand under an icicle until the pot is full. And so you stand under that icicle holding that pot and it seems to take so long to fill that pot with water. And you want to just put the pot down, let it fill itself. But they tell you, no, you need to stand there. And have the patience to fill that pot. And then they go back to meditating and chanting by the fire. And as they meditate and chant by the fire, so you gaze at that water, filling that pot. And eventually that pot fills to the top with water. And they tell you that that water you've just gathered 
is directly from nature. It's cycled around and it'll continue cycling around long after you've been and gone. But that that is a healing elixir. And it'll help you to heal yourself on many levels. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, psychologically. And that that'll help you with your entire journey. And they encourage you to drink. And so you drink that ice cold water. You can feel that water as it passes into your mouth, down your throat and down through your body and then you can feel it almost turning to a warmth as the healing begins to spread around your body down to the tips of your toes, out to your fingertips up to your cheeks, your head round through your face and neck through your chest, your stomach through the whole of your body and you feel that healing passing through you and filling you up and then they tell you you're ready now to head into the cave and you walk into the cave And as you walk into that cave, so you notice this cave is full of crystals. That the tiniest bit of light reflects around the walls, making everything sparkle wherever you look. And that right in the middle of this cave is a space for your crystal. And you walk over, you place that crystal into that space. And as soon as you do, it's almost like it turns on a projector here. It's almost like a holographic projector projecting 3D images that surround you. You notice children having a snowball fight. You see happy people running on a beach, hearing the sound of waves lapping on the shore. People having fun, people walking dogs, people in a park playing. You seem to see many memories and thoughts and ideas from people through time and space. And that person had said that you'll learn from this experience here. And you watch, then begin to feel a sense of positive emotion as you connect with the learning. As that starts taking hold within you. Learning what different images, different movies playing out around you mean how they relate to being. And you feel that that's somehow connecting deep within you and then growing and welling from within you to fill your body like the healing elixir. And then almost as quickly as it had appeared the room went dark, the cave went dark. And you knew that deep inside you, that wisdom has planted, like planting a seed in a garden, and then watering that seed, giving that seed some nutrients, and then just looking after that seed and nurturing that seed and giving it space and time to grow and heal. 
and become what it becomes. And as you leave that cave, that person near the entrance says you've learned what you came here to learn, even if you don't realize it just yet. And you head back out into the snow and you don't yet know how you're going to find your way back to the lighthouse. And when you get back to the cave, you find that just around the side of the cave is a slight glowing humming sound and you realize there's a portal round the side of the cave and you enter that portal and you find yourself on a small island and you can see a storm disappearing off into the distance silent lightning striking in the clouds way off in the distance and you can see on the horizon a light from a lighthouse sweeping across the ocean you then see a long shadow of someone standing in front of the light and you realize that that was you when you were up in that lighthouse and that you're now in the location of that distant light or flash you saw when you stood up there in that lighthouse and you notice that as that storm continues to pass and move further away so the ocean continues to calm and you see a rowboat on this little island and there's a message in a bottle resting on this beach you open the bottle you take that message out and it just says, row. And so you put that message back in the bottle and back on the beach. You push that rowboat down to the shore and just into the water. You climb into the rowboat, push off the shore with the oars and you begin to row towards that lighthouse in the distance. And you bob up and down over the water near the shore. And then the waves get larger, but smoother as you move a bit further out and you head towards that beacon in the distance. And after some time, you reach that shoreline. You pull up that boat at the foot of the cliffs. You climb up the cliffs following a path. And up on top of the cliff, you see that wise person from the cave sitting on a bench. You walk over and sit on the bench next to them. And they tell you, you found what you came here for. And you'll learn that and you'll discover that. And then they stand up from beside you and they walk off, 
Then you stand up and you head home. And at home, you feel like you've had such a long day. You feel like you've had such a strange experience. You feel that it's a lot to process. And so you head to bed, wrap up warm, you settle down, and you drift and float, comfortably and relaxed, soundly asleep. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my words, or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And while you begin to drift comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell a story in the background. And it's a story about a woman who lives in a really nice country house. And she's sitting in her back garden, admiring the views down that garden, drinking a drink, feeling the warmth of the sun on her face, and just feeling a sense of peace, calm and relaxation. And she's watching as the bees fly in and out of the roses on the trellis at the back of the garden. The kind of arches around a path. She watches as butterflies land on the flowers down the side of the garden and admires the different types of butterflies. And she can see the colourful birds landing in trees, singing so beautifully. And the way all the plants just gently sway in the breeze. And as she just sits and watches, she starts gazing up towards the sky, noticing whether there's any clouds up there, thinking about how some clouds can look like different shapes, different animals, and sometimes it's the spaces between the clouds that create the shapes or animals. And as she gazes at the sky, so she begins to feel herself relaxing even deeper, listening to the songbirds, feeling the slightest breeze on her cheeks, and that warmth of the sun, and the wafts of the smell from the flowers. And while relaxing deeper and deeper into the experience, she lets her eyes gently close. And as her eyes gently close, so she has this feeling of drifting out of her body and beginning to float up into the sky and she can see her house down there and she feels so light and free and feels a sense of peace and calm And that pleasant floating feeling, almost like lying on your back in water and floating on your back, where you can see above you 
when you feel weightless and relaxed. She notices how her breathing is slowing and relaxing. And as she continues to float higher and higher and further and further from her home, she sees off in the distance a larger cloud and she begins to get closer and closer to that larger cloud that looks almost like a giant crumpled up ball of cotton wool that looks so soft or a crumpled up ball of silk And as she gets nearer and nearer, she realises there's the most perfectly white palace on this cloud. And she lands on that cloud so easily and effortlessly, landing on her feet. and walks along that soft cloud with each footstep barely making a sound and the cloud comfortably resisting her feet like walking on a lawn with short grass where there's just a little bit of resistance, a little bit of sponginess, but at the same time there's a certain firmness to that ground. But unlike a lawn, there's almost no sound from each footstep. And she walks, toward the palace and as she nears that palace so she notices a road or a path beginning to form in front of her that looks like it's made out of pure white stone but as she walks on it she notices that it feels more like it's somehow a condensed version of the cloud. And she follows that path. And finds her way to a bridge. And notices that it's a drawbridge. And that drawbridge gets lowered over what looks like a sparkling silver river flowing across the cloud. And she walks across that bridge, noticing a slight clippity clop of her feet on the wood before carrying on to an almost noiseless steps the other side. And she heads up and into the palace, knocking on the door of the palace, opening that door, feeling invited as she walks in being aware of how light and airy the palace seems. As light shines in through stained glass windows, illuminating areas of the floor with the most beautiful colours, and other windows higher up, shining pure white light down into the space below.
and then mirrors around different pillars and in different locations, reflecting that light around and spreading that light out, reflecting onto the white walls, and then having it reflecting off the white walls, softening that light creating the most beautiful glow inside this palace. And she walks through the enormous hallway area, thinking to herself how this one space would be large enough to use like a ballroom. And she heads through another door, into another chamber, and this chamber is far more cosy, unlike the section she just came from, where the floor looked like marble but barely made a sound. This floor looks almost like it's carpeted. And although it also barely makes a sound, the slight sound that it does make has a duller tone to it. And that dull tone barely echoes within this room. And she notices that around the walls of the room enormous numbers of books stacked higher than you could reach all around those walls and sitting at the far end of the room in an armchair is what looks like a princess reading a book and she doesn't look up doesn't flinch, doesn't acknowledge that you've entered the room, as if she's totally engrossed in that book, and just turning those pages. And as the woman walks towards her, so she begins to get curious about what this book must be that's so absorbing. And just as she's Almost upon this princess, the princess closes the book, puts it down beside her, and looks up, and then gestures to the comfortable seat behind her. And the woman sits down in that comfortable seat, almost feeling like she's sitting down deeper than she sat down before as if somehow there is some kind of magical property to this comfortable seat. And the princess starts talking to her and telling her that she's going to go on a journey. She's going to go on a bit of an adventure of discovery. And that there's something she's going to learn from this. Something she'll gain inside herself. But there's something that she needs to take with her. And the princess stands up, walks over to the bookshelves, slides a ladder along the bookshelf, Climbs up that ladder all the way to the top. Grabs a small box, climbs back down again, moves that ladder back over again. And sits back down, lifting the lid of the box. Revealing a pocket watch. And she pops open that pocket watch. 
and as she does, the woman can hear the ticking from the pocket watch. And she glances over at that pocket watch and notices that it seems to be keeping good time. And on the inside of the lid is the most beautiful gold that looks so pristine and carved into that is an elaborate pattern of shapes that are all interlocking and behind the hands of that pocket watch she can see the cogs moving and behind the cogs she can notice the way the light seems to be reflecting off that back deep inside the watch and then back out again. As if somehow there's depth to this watch. Like there's more back there than she realises. And the princess tells her that this watch will stop. And when the watch stops, the time that it stops at is the time she needs to know. So she needs to keep an eye on this watch, check it regularly. And the stop, the, and the watch will continue once that time comes around at the right time. And that'll let her know that that moment is the right time. And there'll be a sense of connection. And the woman's a little confused by this. She feels it's a little vague. But she gets handed that pocket watch. She feels the weight of that in her hand. She closes the lid and the princess doesn't give her the box. She just closes that box, puts it down beside her. And the woman puts that pocket watch into her pocket. And the princess ushers her to leave. And so she finds her way back through the palace, back out of that palace, back over that bridge, walks along the cloud, and with just a simple thought, she floats up from that cloud and begins to float and drift back down towards herself. And as she does, she gazes back, and she can see a sheet of rain gently falling from that cloud, and recognises that the location it's falling out the bottom of the cloud is in line with that river that seemed to be passing across in front of the palace. And she wonders whether that river has a leak in the bottom of it somehow. And she floats down towards herself. Arrives back at her property. Drifts inside herself. And then feels herself move a little bit and drift back in that garden. And as she drifts back in that garden, she wonders whether that was just a dream, 
and then she fills her pocket, puts her hand in her pocket, and discovers that pocket watch. And she thinks that that's an unusual experience to have had. Wondering how it could even be possible. And yet the pocket watch proves that she had had that experience. And after having another drink and relaxing in this garden, while the sun is beginning to set. She decides to walk inside her house a moment to think about what this all means. And she sits inside and to keep comfortable inside. She sits by her fire because although it's warm during the day, she's aware it gets cooler at night. And while sitting by the fire, her cat Pickles jumps up on her lap, curls around, and then slumps down on her lap. And she gently strokes Pickles on its back, behind its ear, and with each stroke she notices that purring, and can feel the purring through her hand, and something about Pickles lying there purring, and the sensation of the weight of Pickles resting there, brings a sense of peace, of calmness and comfort to her, almost as if somehow the purring of pickles slows her breathing, helps her muscles relax, and helps her just drift and float peacefully with the experience. And she's aware that she's going to go out for the evening. She wants to begin to just drive around and try and work out what this all means. And she feels that if she can drive around a little bit, maybe it'll make sense. And with pickles on her lap, she looks at that pocket watch. She opens the pocket watch. She can hear it ticking away. And she closes that pocket watch. Puts pickles down on the ground. And decides to go out for a drive for a little bit. To see if anything will stimulate her mind. And give her an idea of what this all means. And she gets into a farm truck that belongs to a neighbour of hers that lets her drive it around this area. And she drives across the fields. She drives over the muddy track. She drives all the way to a distant lake, many miles from her home, parks up the truck, and from in the truck she gazes out the windscreen over the lake, watches as the moon rises in the sky the way that full moon 
illuminates the water. Like dancing splinters of silver on the water. She leaves the truck, closes that door behind her, walks down to the water's edge. and sits by the water's edge, just resting her feet into that cool water. And as she rests there, gazing up at the sky, hearing that incredibly gentle lapping on the shore, that slight tickling around her legs as that water rolls in and out, looking as the finest clouds pass in front of the moon, creating a rainbow in the sky from the moonlight. Noticing the twinkling of those stars, the occasional shooting star. She takes out that pocket watch, flips open the lid, and to try and see the time, she tilts the watch towards the moon. And as she does, she notices a rainbow jump out of the watch and split apart and shine up in the sky. And she realises somewhere deep inside that watch is some kind of a prism that seems so sensitive that it's able to take that moonlight and as well as splitting it into the colours of the rainbow, it seems to be able to amplify that light. And as she moves her hand, she notices that rainbow disappear, and then she moves her hand back and notices it appear again. Then she looks at where that rainbow's going, at where that multicoloured light seems to be reflecting. She wonders if this has anything to do with what's supposed to happen. And as she looks at the hands, she sees that the different hands are passing through different colours, and that the lights seem to be colouring the different parts of the internal part of this watch with those different colours. And then she notices that the two hands stop. And the ticking stops. And she looks at what that time is. And she looks at the colours that the hands are shining through. And she shakes that watch a little bit to see if it'll start that ticking again. She puts it to her ear, can't hear any ticking. So she clicks that lid shut. And she has this strangest sense, almost like she just shut a lid on a rainbow. As if perhaps as long as she doesn't open it and look. That that rainbow will be trapped in there and exists. But she worries that if she pops it open, that bit of rainbow she's trapped will escape and be gone forever. And so she keeps that pocket watch closed, puts it in her pocket, 
can hear the occasional noise of the evening animals. And then decides to go back to the truck and make her journey back home again. And once home, she goes to bed, drifts off asleep, still wondering what this all means. She now has a time, and she knows something will happen at that time. But she doesn't know when that time will happen. She knows she just has to look out for a time that that clock starts ticking again. And she goes to bed and she begins to comfortably drift asleep in bed. And she can hear the gentle ticking of a clock in her room. As she relaxes and drifts asleep. And the next morning, she wakes up early. She has some breakfast. And she's planning on going to the beach. But it's a long drive to the beach. So she gathers herself up some food, a packed lunch for the journey says goodbye to Pickles and watches as Pickles initially seems interested and she thinks, oh, Pickles is going to miss me before Pickles jumps up in her chair turns around, slumps down rests its head on its paws and seems to just fall asleep where it is And she closes the front door and starts her drive to the beach. And as she drives to the beach, so the sun begins to rise. And she looks at the colours of the sky and how those colours change as her journey continues. And after many hours, she stops off at a meadow on the way, sits in that meadow, eats her packed lunch, enjoys watching the wildlife around her, and then continues her journey to that beach. And at the beach, she takes her shoes off, walks along the most beautiful white sand, and can feel that sand through her toes, noticing the way her feet sink into the sand by the water, and the way the sand tickles her feet when she's walking away from the water in that dry and dusty sand. And she can hear that water gently lapping and rolling onto the shore and then rolling back out to sea. And while walking along, she sees a rowboat And she decides to take that rowboat out to an island a little way offshore. And when she makes this trip, she quite likes rowing out, or perhaps even sometimes swimming out to the island. Because most people don't go to that kind of effort. 
And so it's always deserted. It's always a place of peace and calm. Somewhere that she can gather her thoughts. And so she rows out towards that island, arrives at the island, climbs out of the boat, drags it up just onto the shore, and then sits down under the most beautiful palm trees that were just enough shelter from the sun so that she could relax and just take in the environment listening to the way the water rolls onto the shore hearing the sound of leaves moving in the breeze and resting against the palm tree Occasionally, with a slightly stronger gust of wind, she can even feel the slight movement of that palm tree behind her. And as she rests there, just gazing out to sea, so she notices some dolphins swimming along, occasionally jumping in the air, flipping, splashing in the water, other times jumping high, and yet landing nose first so gracefully they barely seem to disturb the surface. Marvelling at the control that they seem to have over their actions, And then she is surprised to hear a voice from behind her. And slightly startled, she turns around to see this woman walking across this deserted island from behind her, from the other side of the island. She wonders where this woman had come from. There's nowhere to have rowed from or swam from on that side of the island. And she walks over and sits down next to the woman. And this woman is confused who this other woman is and where she came from. And she asks, And the woman says that she came from the Emerald Palace. And this woman wonders what the Emerald Palace is. Saying that she doesn't know of any palaces around here. And this woman tells her that it's very nearby. And that she can take her if she wants. But she'll have to leave some things behind on this island, just for now, but she'll be back. And the woman agrees with curiosity. And so she leaves the pocket watch. She leaves a few other items she's got with her. She double checks that the boat is securely up on the shore. And then that woman reaches over, takes her hand, and starts walking towards the far side of the island. And she pulls the woman gently into the water, saying to follow me, that you're going to enjoy this experience, but it may be confusing at first.
and the two of them begin to walk into that water. And this woman rests her hand gently in the centre of the back of the woman. And the woman feels this strange warmth passing through her back passing through her chest, around her neck, up to her cheeks, around her face. And then this woman looks her in the eye, and says, trust me. And then the two of them dive into the water, and as they do, bubbles start appearing around the lower half of this woman. And as the bubbles clear, the woman realises that this person is actually a mermaid that takes her by surprise, seeing this tail behind her. And she's even more surprised by the fact that the tail isn't scaly, as she imagined a mermaid's tail would be. But then she thought to herself, that's probably not a surprise really, given that if this mermaid can breathe air, maybe this mermaid is a mammal. Rather than a fish. And the mermaid's tail was going up and down, rather than side to side. And this woman spent so much time thinking about the fact she just realised that this person is a mermaid, that she didn't even notice at first, that she hadn't needed to breathe, that she seemed to be just so comfortably holding her breath, as if it's the most effortless, comfortable thing in the world. She wasn't trying to hold her breath, but she also wasn't trying to breathe. She was just comfortable, swimming deeper and deeper. And she could hear the underwater sounds. Hear the movement of waves overhead. See rays of sunlight shimmering and dancing. As they were swimming further away from those rays. And everything began to get darker the deeper they swam. And then the mermaid reached over with her other hand, gently touched the woman on the forehead. And she noticed her vision improving. Suddenly she could see better almost as if she had better eyesight to see in low light. And then as they swam deeper and deeper, she began to notice this emerald glow. Initially it looked almost like just a shimmering emerald colour in the sea somewhere off in the distance. And then the closer they got to this glow, the more she noticed that it was a glowing emerald palace deep under the ocean here. And she could see all these mermaids and mermen swimming around the palace, swimming into the palace, swimming out of the palace. 
she could see people swimming on the backs of whales, travelling even faster and even deeper, some riding whales up towards the surface. She could see some seemingly herding fish. It was as if there was an entire community down here that she was totally unaware of. But she was aware that she would have thought this was a strange experience if it hadn't been for the experience she'd had the day before. And she didn't believe the experience she'd had the day before, until she found that she still had the pocket watch. And now she was having this experience. And the two of them swam into that palace. And inside the palace, there was a location almost like an airlock, where they swam in. And then the water level started lowering. And then as the water level lowered, so the mermaid's tail turned back into legs. And by the time the water had drained, she was stood there, looking as human as she did before. And she rested her hand on the forehead of the woman, rested her other hand on the back of the woman. The woman felt that warmth and felt that feeling on her forehead and around her eyes. And then the mermaid said that she just put her breathing and her vision back to normal for now. While they're in the palace. And she looked behind her and could see what looked like the water resting against nothing. As if the water was just there. She had this feeling like she could just put her hand out and touch that water. Or perhaps even put her hand straight through the water into the rest of the ocean. But she didn't want to, just in case she wasn't supposed to. And the two of them walked into the palace. And she wondered why this mermaid found her, how this mermaid found her, and why this mermaid brought her here. And as they walked in the palace, initially their footsteps sounded wet, as their damp feet walked on that solid surface and it was almost like walking on solid glass and she could see the wet footsteps left behind her noticing those footprints and then they walked through a part of the palace that seemed almost carpeted, but it seemed like a natural carpet. Like everything in this part of the palace was alive. Like walking through grass. And the mermaid said that She's aware that the woman had been and seen the princess in the palace in the cloud. And that that watch had stopped. 
and that there's something important about this woman. She just doesn't know it yet. Like many people, we have a purpose in life. We just don't necessarily know it. And the woman was intrigued. And the mermaid said she's got something she's going to give her. And she walks her to this incredibly comfortable seat. She sits down on that seat, almost like resting down in water. Somehow just being weightless on that seat. Almost having a feeling of floating while sitting on the seat. And the mermaid then heads off to grab something. And the woman recognises that this room vaguely resembles the palace in the sky. Except this is deep under the ocean. And this palace is an emerald colour, whereas the palace in the sky was bright white. And that mermaid returns. And she returns with another pocket watch. Only this pocket watch is broken. And she says that it's a special watch. But it's only when it's ticking again that she'll know that the moment is right. And the woman wonders about these vague messages about moments being right. And why all these clocks are going to start ticking at the right time. And so she takes that pocket watch and she's told that she needs to go and get it fixed. And then the mermaid leaves this palace with her. They swim back up through the ocean, back to that deserted island. And back on the deserted island, the woman sits under that palm tree. She has a drink from a fresh coconut. She wonders about the experience so far. She looks at the two watches. She notices their similarities and their differences. She turns them over and looks at the back of them. She doesn't want to pop open the one she got from the palace in the clouds. But she pops open this new one. She listens and can't hear any ticking. She shakes it and can't hear any rattling. She wonders what's wrong with it. She tries to wind it up. But nothing happens. And she puts them both in her pocket. And decides just to rest there for a little bit longer. Before heading back to the main shoreline. Because resting here, she can hear the seagulls overhead. She can watch dolphins out to sea. Listen to the way the waves break on the shore. And while resting on this island, she builds herself 
a hammock between two of the trees, climbs into that hammock and starts reading a book. And she gently tries to swing that hammock just a little bit. giving herself a feeling of almost rocking into relaxation. And as she rocks deeper into relaxation, reading that book, a part of her mind is still elsewhere, wondering about the meaning of the watches. And she waits until gone middle of the day, keeping protected under the canopies of the trees, before heading back to her boat and rowing that boat back to shore. And back on shore she walks along through that beautiful white sand And she begins to hear some circus music in the distance and notices that way off down the shore near the pier there's a circus tent, there's a fairground. And she can see as families are heading along the pier, are heading into that fair, are heading into that circus tent. And she decides to wander down, investigate it for herself, before she'll walk back and journey back home. And so she wanders along the shore, and the closer she gets to the fairground, to the circus, the louder that music gets and the more she notices how many people are there and she can see that there's obviously a show going on in that circus tent and children are coming out with balloons and big smiles on their faces And she decides to get onto a merry-go-round and have a quick ride on that, listening to that music as she bobs up and down, travelling round and round, watching the lights and all the action around her. But she finds that her mind is still wandering and drifting and wandering. And she leaves this area with some candy floss. And eats that candy floss as she walks along. Feeling the way it's melting in her mouth. The way it tickles her nose when it accidentally touches her nose. The way her fingers become sticky as it gets on her fingers. She washes her hands as she finishes that candy floss. And walks along the shore a little further just to find somewhere quiet for a moment to still think and ponder and along the shore there's a few small shops and normally she tries to avoid going this far down she likes the area of the beach 
where there's just sand and countryside and nature. She's not so much a fan of coming to the built-up area, to the pier, to the shops. And as she walks along, so she can see these quaint shops, the signs of what they all are. And she notices that one of them is a watchmaker's. And she wonders whether they could fix the watch. She doesn't know what she'll say if she's asked where it's from. But she'll just try and be vague. And she heads into that quaint watchmaker's store. Bell ringing as she walks in. Bell ringing as the door closes behind her. She can hear ticking coming from all directions around her, with the clocks over the walls, cabinets full of watches. And an elderly man, hunched over with glasses, with a little microscope on the end of the glasses, and an item that seems to have the smallest end to it. He seems to be working on something, and he doesn't look up, he doesn't flinch, he doesn't respond at all to her entrance. He seems so focused on the job that he's doing. And so she looks at the different clocks around the wall. She looks in the cabinet, at the different watches and then goes and stands near the counter and she waits for this elderly man to finish what he's doing and she doesn't know how long it will take him but she feels like it would be rude and not sensible to interrupt him when he looks like he's so busy and focused on a delicate job. And then after a little while, he finishes what he's doing and very carefully and slowly gazes up towards the woman, moves his head back as he sees her too close then remembers to take the glasses off and says that you get so lost looking through them that the reality through them is all you end up seeing. You lose track of all the reality around the outside because you're just focused on the task at hand through the microscope. And that you have this feeling almost like you're in that tiny world. And all you can see is that very fine tip of the instrument you're using. And it feels like you're using a small instrument, despite the fact that you're using something that's very long in your hand. And he asks her what it is that she wanted. And she said that she's got a watch that needs fixing. And she takes the watch out of her pocket. The one from the mermaid. She places it down on the counter. And he pops it open. And he makes a few noises, a few ums and ahs. He makes some noises of curiosity. He puts the glasses back on and takes a closer look. He takes the glasses off and asks where the watch came from. And 
and the woman says that she got it in the sea. And he just responds with a, ah, oh, and carries on looking. He doesn't seem to question her vagueness or what she was saying. And yet she's aware that it doesn't look like it's something that has been underwater, especially not like something that's been underwater in the ocean. And he looks up and says that he can fix this watch, but it'll take him just a little while. And if she wants, she can sit and wait. He explains that he's got a small little lounge just through the back of the shop. And so she agrees that she'll sit and wait. She walks into that lounge, sits down in the lounge, and while she sat there waiting, she begins to feel the sense like she's getting a bit bored, like she wants to twiddle her thumbs, wants to be doing something, and she doesn't know how long it'll take. And then a man walks in, and he sits down near her, he explains he's the watchmaker's son, and he thought he'd give her some company, and asks if she wants to go out for a little bit, for a bit of a walk along the seafront, rather than being cooped up here in this lounge. And together they wander along the seafront. They walk back near the pier. They walk on to a bench a little way on from the pier. They sit on that bench, gazing out to sea. And she asks the watchmaker's son what he does what sort of things he's interested in. He explains that he's an artist. He likes painting. He explains that he paints in an unusual way at times. That he's got a way of painting images in people's minds. that that's kind of how he paints, for real. That the painting happens in his mind, and then his hand just turns what's in his mind into reality. And he can help others to see that. And the woman's curious by this. And so he says, well, I'll have you paint the view in front of you, and the two of them stand up from the bench. He gently touches her shoulders, positions her to face out towards the sea. He stands in front of her, gently lifts her arms, so gently that it's almost as if he wasn't touching her arms. Almost as if she can't tell whether she's lifting her own arms or he's lifting her arms. He moves her arms around a little, making sure her elbows are bent and the arms are in a comfortable position. He then moves back beside her, reaches around with one arm to reposition the far arm while using her, his other hand to reposition the arm nearest to him. And then looking in front of her, with her, he says, just imagine an easel in front of you. And imagine it. So there's a canvas on that easel. 
and the canvas is just slightly lower than your eyes. And so your eyes can see the view over the canvas. And tilting your eyes down ever so slightly, you can see on the canvas. And just notice how pure and white that canvas is. Focus in on the canvas, notice the texture of the canvas, what it's made of. Almost noticing each individual thread on that canvas. Then tells her to breathe calmly and deeply and to very slowly have a sense of reaching down as if there's a brush in the hand, dabbing some paint together of the colour of the sky, beginning to just loosely smear that onto the canvas and notice how that begins to appear. Notice how some of it runs organically and naturally just flowing on the canvas. And then dabbing some water, cleaning that brush off a little, and then dabbing a different colour, and doing that colour of the ocean. And initially just doing some quite loose colours, getting the bulk of the colours down, and then doing the same with the sand. And then beginning to dab in and add in some detail. And doing this so slowly. And intentfully. And the woman found herself drifting and floating inside her mind. As if her body was working automatically. And she started having this feeling. Like she was genuinely painting. And then with that feeling started coming a vision as if that canvas was really there. And the way he was looking at the canvas as if it was really there for him too. The way he gestured towards it. The way he helped to mark out different things on that canvas with such conviction. And he talked about just noticing that slight waft of the smell of the paint. And hearing the sound of that brush on the canvas, hearing the sound of the brush in the paint, hearing the sound of that brush in the water, And a slight clinking sound as the brush taps on the side of that jar of water. And he guides her to paint. And once she's completed, she has this sense of putting the brush down. And he notices in her that she has completed the painting and he praises her on that painting and says you'll always have that painting with you. And then he taps her on the shoulder just very gently and she feels this sense of drifting out of that reverie and paying attention to him again. And they sit down on the bench. She notices that that painting has disappeared, the easel has disappeared. But she's got that experience with her. And she feels a certain connection to this person. And while they sit there, The sun begins to set, and as the sun sets, 
So he just gently rests his arm around her, noticing that she had acted like she was just starting to get a little cold. And she allows that hug. She rests her arm back around him. She rests her head gently onto his shoulder. Feeling the warmth of his body against hers. Feeling the tightness of that hug and the secureness of that. And feeling a sense of love and peace and a sense of harmony. Being aware that they seem to be breathing the same and relaxing and how this moment seems to be slowing down and standing still as if the waves rolling on the shore are slowing down having more space between each wave and being in this moment And she starts to feel a certain fluttering in her chest. A sense that there's more to this moment than she thought there would be to this chance encounter. And after what felt like just a minute, but was probably much longer, The two of them started heading back to that shop. And as they arrived back in the shop, the watchmaker glanced up at them, gave a smile, and said that he's fixed that watch. And he placed that watch on the counter. He asked, Do you have any other watches like it? It's a really interesting watch. If you do, I'd love to see them. And she says she's got another one in her pocket. She got it from a different location and said she couldn't really explain where. But it was nowhere near that watch. And she placed that down on the counter. And as the watchmaker pressed the button to pop open the lid, so a flash of rainbow light burst out of the watch just for a split second and the watch began ticking and she realised that the time on the watch and the time that it currently is is 24 hours later and as she looks at the man beside her She sees the way that he's smiling at her. She sees that it looks like he wants to ask her something. And she wants to be asked. And he asks if she's happy to see him again. And she says no. I'm happy to see you now. And she puts an arm around him to settle his moment of confusion. That moment she knows she made him worry just for a second. But knows that's why he smiled deeper than he had before. 
she sees that watchmaker smiling. She then says, let's go back to the beach. She tells him she's got an unusual story to say and that he may not believe it and she doesn't yet know what it means but she knows somehow he's involved and they walk down onto the beach They light a small campfire. They cook some food on that campfire on the beach while she shares her tale with him. And she's surprised that somehow he seems to be engaged with this tale, nodding, demonstrating intrigue and curiosity. And she shows the two watches and lets him examine them. And he asks questions about that palace in the cloud. He asks questions about the palace deep under the sea, about the mermaid. And a part of her thinks to herself, is it normal for someone to just take your word for everything like this when you're telling them stuff that's so strange? And he then says he's also got a story to share. That he's the watchmaker's son, but he doesn't live there. That... The previous day, he'd had an experience where he was drifting off asleep, just relaxing at home. And then he found himself walking through some woods, exploring that woodland. And he encountered the most bizarre place that no one would believe if he told them. He encountered what looked almost like a partially see-through house. And he couldn't figure out how else to explain it. And he said that he felt compelled to walk to the door. And he knocked on the door. And someone wearing purple robes with a purple hat and a black and white wand answered the door. And he was surprised by this at the time. But the person just smiled and seemed so friendly and they invited him in. And as they closed the door behind them, he noticed the way all the walls just seemed to wobble and vibrate, as if the house was made of jelly. But something about the experience felt so comforting and natural. And he sat down on the chair. He was gestured to sit in. And the house had this strong smell of chocolate. And then he realised the chair he was sitting in was like a giant chocolate cookie chair. And when this wizard turned their back, he tested his theory by breaking a piece off under his hand and quickly eating it before the wizard turned back again. And he said that this wizard was asking questions and he was there trying to chew really fast, secretly, because the wizard was wondering why he wasn't answering. And the woman found this story amusing. 
this idea that he's doing something that's a bit cheeky. That it's almost like doing something just a little naughty in school and trying not to get caught. Nothing particularly wrong, just a bit cheeky and trying to get away with it. And she was hanging on his every word as he described this experience. He described how he was given a book. And he thought about how he loved reading books. And he was told not to open this book until he'd left this house. Until he'd left the woodland. And he said that he left the house and he left the woodland. And when he opened the book, he found that after about page 48, there was no pages. A hole had been cut in the book. And he was a bit irritated by the damage to the book, thinking the wizard could have just given him a box and not damaged the book. But in that gap in the book was a watch and the note with the watch said take this to be fixed. He said that was the watch that his dad was working on when she arrived and that was why he was there. that ordinarily he wouldn't have been there at that time, that he doesn't see his dad as often as he perhaps should, that he's normally too busy doing his own thing. And he said that the next day he'd had a similar bizarre experience, that this morning he woke up He left his home. He knew that he was going to come and see his dad. He had the book in his car next to him, pocket watch in the book. And he pulled over at a location and there was someone there who asked him if he could help them. And so he went and started to help. And he said it was the weirdest thing, that here they are, in this hot environment. And there's this person creating an ice sculpture, on the beach. And they're saying they want this sculpture finished, before all the ice melts. And so he said he spent most of the morning, carving a giant ice sphere, on the seafront, somehow feeling like helping, despite knowing that no sooner as he finished creating this, it's going to all melt and run away, and that there's just going to be a moment to capture the beauty of the sculpture, and that anyone around beforehand or afterwards will miss out. And then he said that that was his reason for being so motivated to help. That there'll be just that moment in time when there's something precious that if you can capture that and you can see that and experience it and share that experience with others. He described it like that moment you see a shooting star and know that if you were looking moments earlier or moments later, if you were blinking, if you were looking down or looking elsewhere, or hadn't gone outside, you'd miss that moment. And this started to teach him about the preciousness of making the most of moments. Making the most of wonder, of curiosity.
and the two of them spoke as the sun had set. As the fire began to burn down to embers, and was just glowing, illuminating that sand, the sound of the beach in the background, the coolness of the air, stars in the sky, the way the moon illuminated the ocean. And just then, a woman walked over and sat down on the ground, and she was instantly recognised as being the mermaid. And she said that the two of you have now found each other. That your soulmates were meant to be. That you've been missing each other. For many years. That you've all nearly had your paths cross repeatedly. And that there's so much you're going to create together that's more than you create on your own. And that the universe just needed to give a little helping hand because of the things you'll be achieving. And that the future will unfold in its own way, in its own time. And that it's the discovery of that future, the curiosity, the wonder, that'll help to drive you both. And so the future's not going to be revealed, just that you need to face that future together. and your different learnings through the last 24 hours are complementary to the way forward. And the mermaid handed over a plate of strawberries, said a gift from us, before heading back down to the ocean, diving in and disappearing. And then the man walked the woman back to her car. She travelled back home with an excitement she hadn't felt for quite a while about a new chapter of her life. She looked forward to excitedly telling her cat. Although at the same time she wondered whether people would think that was strange. That she wants to get home and tell her cat about her experiences. And he headed home as well. They knew they were going to see each other in the future. And once home, after relaxing for a while, she went up to bed, settled down in bed, and with pleasant thoughts in her mind, thoughts of what the future holds, the positives, what she's got to look forward to, and understanding now about the connection, and a broader sense of the world around her. With a smile that seemed to pass through her body, she drifted and comfortably floated and relaxed, asleep, 
sleeping deeply and soundly all night long. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation about a man who wakes up one day to the sound of the grandfather clock downstairs chiming at 8 a.m. And every morning with the sound of that chiming he gets up he gets straight out of bed and he heads downstairs and as he heads downstairs so he hears the ticking of that grandfather clock and he always tries to get downstairs near the clock before all eight chimes have sounded And then he walks through to the kitchen. He makes himself a drink. And some breakfast. And he likes to jump straight up out of bed, feeling alert and awake. Because he knows that when he was younger, he used to sleep through alarms and used to allow himself to drift and float deeper asleep when an alarm sounded. He would just reach over, turn it off, roll over, and fall back asleep. So now he has his routine, where he wakes straight up, leaves bed, walks downstairs, and make sure that way he doesn't go back to bed and lie down. And for breakfast he always looks in the cupboards, to see what he can have today. And he'll sometimes have toast with a different spread, other times pancakes, other times cereal. Then he unlocks the back door, walks outside the back of his house, breathes in the fresh morning air, fills that air as it passes, in through his nose, down into his lungs, almost feeling it passing through his body. He turns to face the sun, even on cloudy days, closes his eyes and allows the warmth of the sun to begin to wake up his body clock. He has a drink and then heads back inside. heads through to the living room where he often finds his dog just lying there sleeping in the corner of the living room. He sometimes thinks that his dog's lazier than he is and seems to want to sleep more than he wants to sleep. And so he goes over, he pets the dog, he sees the dog move around and he swears that he notices the dog's eyes close tighter, almost as if the dog is trying to say, don't wake me up, I want to sleep. And then he starts tickling the dog and then the dog always wakes up and joins in and has fun with him. And they sit and play for a while, before he then heads out on a walk with his dog. 
and when he leaves his house to go on a walk. He walks down the street, turns into a park, and as he walks through the park so he can notice other dog walkers, some being far more active than he is. Now at the other side of the park, there's a footpath that leads down to the beach. And so he cuts through that footpath, cuts through the overhanging trees, the rustling leaves. Noticing the colours of those trees, the brown of the bark, the green of the leaves, the crunching of each footstep that he takes. before it opens up to a beautiful sandy beach. He then lets that dog off of the leash. And the dog rushes around, runs down to the sea, instantly just leaps a wave and splashes down through another wave and then runs and splashes, jumping waves, trying to bite waves, rolling in the water, before running back out onto the sand and rolling in the sand. And the man throws a ball a few times, and the dog runs after it and brings it back. And to the man, he's just having a leisurely stroll. While his dog is just rushing around, using so much energy. He's always surprised how much energy the dog seems to use, given how lethargic the dog seems when they're at home. And as they walk along the beach, so they can see a father and a child building the most grand sand castle. They've dug a moat all the way from the seashore, sloping down, guiding that water down that channel and around this grand castle. They've managed to fashion sand bridges over that water. And they've obviously used many buckets of sand to carefully build up that sand castle. And now they're going around that sand castle carefully smoothing the edges, carefully smoothing the turrets, just making it just right. And just as that father and child step away from the sandcastle to admire it, and the father gets his phone out to take a photo of the sandcastle and his child smiling next to it, and the dog leaps in the air, turns his back to the sandcastle to catch the flying ball, and skids straight through the sandcastle rolling down the other side and then proudly displaying the ball in its teeth. And the man was really distressed and upset and worried about what they might think and runs over to apologise but as he gets there, so he notices the father laughing so hard and that the child looks sad, but the father is laughing so hard. 
and the man runs over, saying, sorry, 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 and is really apologetic. And the man turns his phone to the other man and shows the photo that he got of the dog with the most weird expression, reaching for the bull, cheeks flared open, some saliva going everywhere, legs flailing, with a cloud of sand spraying up from the sand castle. And this man just thought this was the funniest photo. And when he showed it to his son, his son couldn't help but keep laughing as well. And couldn't be angry at the dog when it came up, dropped the ball at his feet and started knocking its head against the child's leg and wrapping itself around the child's legs, wanting to play. And the father said that it's fine. It's only sand. They can rebuild it. That what's been created here is greater than the sand castle. It's a memory that won't be forgotten. It's something that probably will never happen again. That they'll probably come to the beach, they'll probably build multiple sand castles. But now when they do that, they'll laugh and remember that time the dog flew through the castle. And they have the photo to prove it. They'll be able to tell the mother what happened and show the photo. They'll be able to tell friends, family. And all these people will laugh. And so that one event that chance random event will bring happiness and joy to so many people. Even though on the surface, the first reaction was that something that was worked so hard for was destroyed. And the man asked if he could be sent a copy of the photo that he'd like to be able to print it off. And the father said that that would be fine. And the man apologised again about the sand castle and carried on walking along the beach with his dog. And while walking along, he was sure that his dog had a smug smile but he felt that dogs shouldn't be able to have smug smiles. He just felt that the way that dog was walking and looking, he knew the dog knew what it had done. And even though the father and the child were okay with what had happened, he still felt a bit guilty about it. And he still wanted to tell the dog off, but at the same time couldn't bring himself to do so. Because when he looked at his dog's face, he would just smile. And he couldn't be mad at him. And so they carried on walking along the beach. And from time to time that dog ran down into the water splashed around, tried to eat the waves, leapt over some, dived through others, seemed to always want to roll in the sand when it came out of the water, rather than just shaking itself off to dry itself off. And he was sure the dog did that again, just to be cheeky, 
knowing that it made him all dirty and that when he then shakes himself off it makes everyone jump back and a little way along the path they turned up from the beach down another footpath through into some more woodland and they wandered through this woodland gradually weaving up through the woodland up a slight hill until they came out into a meadow up on top of a hill and up here on this meadow they could see a myriad of flowers and grasses all blowing in the breeze. They could see down over a small village. They could feel the warmth of the sun. Notice clouds in the sky. And the man took this moment to just place his coat on the ground and then sit on his coat and rest back on his arms and he just rested there looking out over the meadow while his dog wandered around sniffing at the plants following scents that are unseen jumping, rolling around and then occasionally just lying down for a little bit and resting also. And while he rested there he watched as swallows darted around in the sky as some Birds of prey circled high overhead as the occasional dragonfly darted into view, hovered and then made impossible seeming manoeuvres jetting off in different directions and could hear that wind blowing gently across the meadow watching butterflies land on different flowers having a drink and then flying off to another flower and bees going from plant to plant and just relaxing and being in the moment being out in nature and while he rested here he got his phone out and started reading a book on his phone and he was a little way through this book and as he read this book so he began to get drawn into the story drawn into a story about someone in space circling the earth in a shuttle and part way round the earth the shuttle encountered an anomaly and as it passed through that anomaly it vanished and as it vanished it reappeared elsewhere in the past and it was still on its same journey around the earth it's just the earth below wasn't at the same time as it was moments earlier and the people on the shuttle 
suddenly lost contact with the ground control. And they couldn't hear anything. They couldn't pick up any signals coming from the planet below. They couldn't detect anything else in orbit with them. And they had to start working at trying to solve this problem. Trying to work out what happened and how they can get back to their present time. And 90 minutes later, suddenly they encountered the anomaly again in space. And they passed through that anomaly again. And as they did, the earth below seemed to change again. It was as if they perhaps had gone back in time even further. And they realised that this anomaly seems to be transporting them back through time. And so they had to figure out how they could head through the anomaly the opposite direction. But they knew that they couldn't just fire thrusters, turn around and fly back the other way. Because they're travelling thousands of miles an hour in one direction. But they need to know exactly where the anomaly is. And so they work out a way of just subtly changing their orbit so that the next time round they just miss the anomaly. And when they go round again, they're a few degrees further out of line with the anomaly. And over a number of weeks, they circle the Earth below. each time moving a few degrees until eventually they're facing the opposite direction and now they're going to be coming at that anomaly from the opposite route and this time as they pass through the anomaly the planet below transforms back to how it was before. And then 90 minutes later, when they pass through the anomaly again, it transforms again. And they can suddenly hear ground control. They can suddenly hear and pick up other transmissions and recognize other stuff in space with them. And then they have a dilemma. Do they go through the anomaly to see if it'll take them into the future? Knowing how hard it is to turn around and go back through again. Or do they just steer now to avoid the anomaly. Warn others about this anomaly here. And then just carry out their normal mission and return to Earth as planned. And they decide that they're going to tell ground control what has occurred, share everything they know with ground control, and tell them that they're going to fly through the anomaly again, that they know there's a risk. And so they don't know how far they travel one direction or the other, 
They couldn't work out exactly how far into the past they had travelled, so they don't know exactly how far into the future they'll travel. But they tell Ground Control that if this works and they end up in the future, just to be prepared, to make sure that there's an alert that's permanently from this point forth on every mission log that something could come from this direction until that event has occurred to make sure that when they pass through the anomaly there shouldn't be anything on the other side directly in line with them And then, at the end of the 90 minutes, they pass through that anomaly. And they come out in the distant future. They see a giant hovering space station that looks like it's tethered, like a giant hammer tethered to the earth. they can see lights zipping up and down from the earth up to that space station and from the space station down to the earth. And they can see different kinds of lights. Lights going up and down almost like a lift in a tube. And then there's larger circles or donut shapes that seem to be rising up carrying more stuff up to that space station before lowering back down again and not long after they pass through and come out in the future and they receive a message telling them how far they've travelled into the future. Telling them that people have been ready and waiting and avoiding the anomaly through time. And that they already knew when they were going to appear because they made it back safely and were able to report back when they had appeared. And what had happened. And so although they don't know right now. What happened. There is a report. Existing. Of what happened that they wrote. And they find this a really unusual concept. To know that there's a document that they wrote. Saying what their entire experience was here. That they've not yet had and explaining the exact time that they've arrived that they don't yet know that was shared because they know they make it safely back but they don't know yet that they are going to make it safely back and they get told that here now it's so far in the future that it's easy for their shuttle to have some small unmanned drones put alongside it and they'll fire thrusters in different directions that can help the shuttle turn around and face back to the anomaly without it having to repeatedly circle the earth gradually changing direction And so they talk about this time period without revealing much about the technologies other than what they can see from the shuttle. And they share how far in the future this is. And the astronauts are impressed with how much will be achieved 
and pleased that something gets achieved. And they have a mission here, something they can do that others can't, because others have developed thinking styles that have stopped them thinking quite so basic. And yet these astronauts from the past think far more basic. And so there's certain problem solving that they do well. And so they help these future people with that. Before heading back home. And as they head back home, and the story reaches a, a natural point to stop reading, that man drifts out of the story and back to the meadow. And back in the meadow, he glances over to his dog, makes sure the dog is still behaving and still there. He listens to those rustling leaves of the trees. And after a little bit, he stands up, walks through the meadow, whistles for his dog, who comes running over, bounding across the meadow. And they walk down the hill, down that meadow down towards that village down there. And as they near the village, so they wander into a pedestrianised street with some nice quaint shops on either side and the smells of the butchers, of the bakers and the other smells of florists the market, the sounds of a church bell ringing at the end of the village. Heading down and over a bridge, over a river, following that river bank. And while following that riverbank, the man often does this walk and heads to where he grew up as a child, to some woodland he used to play in. And he arrives at that bit of woodland just off the riverbank, walks into the woods, and he can see his zip wire that he built years earlier that he connected to trees up high on the hills, all the way down to the trees at the bottom of the hills. And it was made out of wire. And it's been there for decades. And he knows that children frequently stumble across this and then use it. And sometimes you have to remove some branches that have crossed the path of the zip wire. But it doesn't take a lot of effort and then you can use it. And so he pulls it all the way to the top with his dog following him all the way up to the top of the hill. And the zip wire has a small bit of wood to sit on. He places that between his legs, jumps up, lifts his legs up, and feels the bounce of the wire as he lands back onto the seat, and the pulley travels down that wire, hitting a rubber tyre at the end, throwing him up in the air a little bit. before bouncing him back a little bit away from that tree. 
and he feels as accelerated now doing this as he used to as a child. And he does that a few more times, recapturing his youth in his mind. And he's pleased that something he put together so many years ago is still here and still able to be used and still able to bring fun to many people. And as it zips down the hill, the dog often chases after him, barking and panting, and then skidding to a halt as he suddenly stops at the bottom. And then he continues his walk. He often follows this path down the river, down to the second bridge, crosses that bridge, and walks back up the other side of the river, almost like walking in a large circle. He finds not only is this good for giving his dog a walk and giving him some exercise, but it also helps with his mental health and helps to make sure that he gets some fresh air and he finds many needs met from this walk where he wanders through countryside down to the beach and through countryside he stops and reads and relaxes for a while then recaptures some childhood memories before continuing his walk along the river over the bridge and back up the other side of the river, following that other side of the river, and then over another bridge, and then heading back towards the woodland. And as he heads back towards the woodland, he passes under a silver arch sculpture and on top of that silver arch sculpture is what looks like a silver jet plane and out the back of that silver jet plane is a silver trail heading down joining with the top of the arch and then passing off the side of the arch, almost as if that jet has flown towards the arch, turned up to avoid the arch, and just skimmed the tip of the arch, almost as if it's barely touching the silver arch itself. And it's been sculpted with so much detail and so much movement in its work, that it just looks like it could have been flying right there. And it seems to be barely touching that arch, so much so, that you could almost be convinced, if you just glanced, that it was something flying past an arch. Almost like it's defying gravity over the arch. where the point of contact between the trail from behind the jet and the point not even on the top of the arch but just near the side of it just makes contact, doesn't look enough contact to hold the weight of that jet. And he always walks through the arch and has this sense of the importance of this arch to this area. To those who have fought in many conflicts and are being remembered. 
and so he feels that it's important to walk through that arch. And that fighter he always thinks of as looking like it's trying to do a victory lap in the sky, as if it's circling around and releasing some smoke behind it in celebration. Like the end of some difficult times. And he continues along that path into the woodland. As he walks into the woodland, so he notices this part of the woodland is deeper and denser. Sound is more muffled. And the rustling of the leaves overhead take on a slightly deeper tone. And it's darker in this part of the woodland. An even less breeze can make it into the woodland here. And so he feels a deeper sense of peace, a deeper sense of solitude, a greater opportunity to think about things and process things in his mind. as he walks through this part of the woodland. And this is his healing journey. This is his healing walk that he makes every day. Where anything playing on his mind when he gets to here, this is when he takes his time to think about it, to process that. So that when he arrives home, he can arrive home clear-headed. He can arrive home leaving anything he doesn't want to arrive home with behind him. Where here he can process those things. And as he walks through here, so his mind wanders and starts processing. He starts to have a sense of pacing in a measured way through a Zen garden. He can notice the peace. He can notice the rhythm he can notice the order in this garden and notice the way that a sand is raked. So order can be created. Knots in life can be undone. And as stones are placed strategically, they can have tremendous meaning. Meaning what stone and where. And then how it's placed. And then sitting on a large black stone carefully reached, walking across sand, raking behind where you're walking. As he sits, crosses his legs on that stone in his mind's eye, and takes some deep, purposeful breaths, breathing out longer than breathing in, being present and in the moment, being aware of where he is, 
aware of where sounds are. Almost like making time here stand still. And as he's aware of here and his eyes close, it's as if his eyes are open, as if he's got a third eye that can see when his eyes are shut. that can see a representation of the world around him as he rises outside of himself and can see himself sat there meditating rising above himself seeing mountains in the distance and floating as a mind to the mountains floating, drifting through space and time over to those mountains and settling down in front of a cave high up in the mountains. Perched just in the entrance of a small cave, just big enough to camp in. and thinking about a fire outside that cave and seeing a small wood campfire appear and thinking about something comfortable to wrap up, snuggle down in and noticing that appear the most comfy, fluffy blankets that he wraps around himself as he sits in the entrance to that cave hearing the wind whistle with the most beautiful note behind him and back out of that cave past his ears and that crackling of the fire while he gazes down and can see himself sat all the way over there in the distance in the Zen garden and can see everything in between and can recognise this as his mind where the connection between the him walking through the woods and him up here in this mountain is that him down there in the Zen garden? Where here he can look down and survey his mind, surveying a metaphorical landscape of his mind. All the worries, darkness, all the light and pleasures, and everything in between. And from up here, and just like controlling a lucid dream or programming a computer game he can work on programming and influencing the landscape below from this position up high above that landscape from this relaxed calm position Rewinding areas of darkness to bring light and comfort. Adding more light and movement and excitement to other areas. Creating easy paths through woodland, through dense forest, to areas of pleasure and happiness. and making forest thicker and harder to travel through to areas of pain to areas that it's 
preferable not to travel to. While seeing the animals in the forest, seeing the animals in the rivers, seeing the birds overhead, working in harmony with this world, seeing the plants, the trees, all working in harmony, that even those dark forests, those dark areas, become brighter, and more appealing as time goes on, as that work continues, as they get tended to by animals, and then up here, they have a sense of relaxing by this fire, and drifting into their own deep meditation, almost like a deep spiritual meditation that this person up here is having, connecting with the world around them, being able to lower their hands down to the ground beneath them, and as those hands touch the ground, so they feel a deep connection, almost like their hands and the ground beneath them become one and fuse on some level. As a purple healing glow spreads out through every atom of this land from those hands, even spreading into the sky, beginning to give the sky a slight purple tinge. And then as the fire burns down to embers, so they have a sense of opening their eyes and launching from the cave and flying back to that them in the Zen garden. and then leaving that Zen garden and finding themselves reaching the end of the woods, walking out of those woods with their dog alongside them, heading out of the woods, following that path, past a park, seeing some children playing, back towards the street, on the way home, and then arriving home, the dog feeling satisfied with the long walk, instantly going in and lying back down in bed, The man going in, hearing the ticking of that grandfather clock. And seeing that it's now 11 o'clock. And a couple of hours have passed since waking up. And making a drink. And sitting down in the back garden to relax briefly before carrying on with the day. And then on this day, they carry out a few chores, they lead a normal day, they grab some lunch, they watch some TV in the afternoon, they spend a lot of time in their garden and they do a bit of gardening and they see what looks like 
a diamond hanging on a thread from a tree at the end of the garden, just gently spinning at the end of the garden. They head down to that diamond. They don't know whether it's a diamond or not, or whether it's just another crystal. But they spin it in their hand, and as they do, they see rainbow shards of light dance from that crystal as the sun catches it while it spins. And while that happens, so the tree appears to move. And as that tree moves, they find a portal opening up. And they're curious what's happening, but comfortable as well. And they walk through the portal. And as they walk through that portal, so they descend some steps. They walk down those steps. And as they walk deeper down the steps, they realise that there's some secret place here under the end of their garden. They realise that that tree has never been a real tree. But they don't remember seeing that crystal hanging from the tree before. And they don't know why turning that crystal and having that light reflect off it has opened this portal, opened this pathway. And they realise that deep under where they live, there seems to be a whole other world, a whole secret area. like a civilization living under a civilization. And they can see animals and trees. They can see what looks like people. And they go to talk to some of these people. And they find out that this area was built many decades earlier when there was conflict in this area and they thought that the conflict may not go in their favour and so they had built this area they'd built some secret ways down into this area and ever since it's been kept active. And many of these people down here are scientists, military personnel. And they can see what looks like the most incredible aeroplanes. And they talk about how there's tunnels going off many miles that head out to cliffs that can launch these planes through fake cliffs if needed. And that they do so when testing those planes at times. And they say that they're going to have to wipe the mind of this person. And he doesn't want his mind wiped. And they tell him that if he can be of help to them, then his mind won't have to be wiped. If he agrees to continue to keep it a secret, and perhaps even work with them 
on some of their projects. And they hand him a box and they tell him, if you can access that box, we won't wipe your mind. And they explain that it takes a lot of training and knowledge to be able to access that box. To know what the right pattern is and to recognize the kind of pattern. And while they're telling him this, and he's watching and listening to them, his hands absent-mindedly ping open the box to reveal a golden key and he takes that key and they're surprised at how fast he managed to access that box that others take years of training They then take him to a building and tell him that if he can make his way round the maze in this building, blindfolded, then he can prove himself and open the door with the key at the other end of the maze. And so he walks into the maze blindfolded then he puts his left hand on the nearest wall and he starts walking. And he walks and he walks, keeping his left hand on the wall. And he doesn't take his left hand off of the wall and he walks and he walks and he walks until he finds the exit. And he uses the key, opens the door, and even through his blindfold, he can notice the bright light. And he takes off the blindfold, and he sees the most incredible sight. What looks like a vast UFO in a highly illuminated room. And the person that saw him into the maze is stood there, surprised that he'd managed to navigate a maze blindfolded. And he said that it's easy. I just kept my hand on the wall. And they say there'll definitely be a position for you here. That we're working on incredible things for the future. And they asked what he does currently. And he explains that he walks his dog. That he reads. That he learns and studies the world. That he gets lost in thought. And fantasies. that he sees the world differently to most others. He sees beauty and wonder. But at the same time, gets surprised and down because of his overthinking. And he explains that he used to be a musician but he lost all confidence. And so he still makes some money from his music that's out there, but doesn't really do anything else with his life. He's felt lost. He's felt without a purpose for a while. And 
he's wondered what that purpose would end up being, what would give him new purpose, what would give him a challenge and something to work for. And now this opportunity has presented itself. And they're quick to hire someone who thinks how he thinks. And he gets shown back out of this base. And it just happens that that portal to here is in his garden. And he'd never noticed it until today. He'd never discovered that portal, even though it was always there. And as the sun sets, so he settles down for the evening before heading to bed, wrapping himself up comfortably under his quilt, sinking his head deep into the pillow and drifting and floating into the most beautiful dream and then on into the most healing deep sleep, sleeping well through the night. Just take a moment to Allow yourself to get comfortable and allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, I'm just going to tell this guided sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my words or to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, you can have a sense of an old lady sat in a rocking chair on the porch of a farmhouse. And the old lady's just rocking backwards and forwards with that creaking of the rocking chair on the wooden floor the sounds of birds flying high in the sky. Looking out over that farm. Looking out over the fields and the setting sun. And her grandchildren come to see her and talk to her. And they sit down cross-legged on the floor and she starts to tell them a story. She tells them that this is a true story from her life. It's a story of intrigue, of wonder, a story so incredible. She's curious whether they'll even believe her as she tells it. And she begins to tell this story. She tells the children to sit down comfortably and relax. And if they want to let their eyes close, they can, while they listen along. And she talks about how many years ago, when she was a young woman, she went out on a ship and she was sailing around the earth. She was going to sail to many countries. And as she sailed, she had a crew that came with her. And she had a book that she was following. And in this book was marked places that someone centuries earlier had travelled to and the myths and legends they discovered on those lands. 
and she was curious what it was that led to these myths and legends. She'd imagined that the writings about a kraken, about a large sea monster, were probably just sightings of a large squid. Perhaps even sightings of whales breaching. And so she was sure that she could intellectually explain all of the writings in the book. And she wanted to rewrite this book factually trying to find out what led to the author writing those myths. And across the sea, there was very little to see. There was no kraken, no sea monsters, just calm, open ocean. Whatever direction she looked, was just blue sea to the horizon, the occasional white, wispy cloud in the sky. And that boat just bobbing up and down. And after a few days, they approached the first piece of land. And she could see on the land that stuck out into the sea, that there was some kind of a fort. And she could see the turrets on top of the fort. And she could see a light reflecting from the top, like someone was reflecting sunlight with a mirror. And she could notice that that was communicating a code with the flashes of the light. And they worked out that this code was communicating for them to come to shore in that location. So they headed over towards that fort. They docked that boat. The woman looked at her book looked at where this place was and saw that it was near a location that was in the book. So she decided while they were in port here, she would go and explore. So she rented a horse and it was just a small Shetland pony. And she rode that Shetland pony, bouncing and bobbing up and down on its back, with its legs flailing around, trying to make it trot along rapidly. And its fast clippity-clopping along the dirt paths. And she rode that out from the settlement, through a valley, into some woodland, and on beyond the woodland, to a river. And she kept checking her book, to see where she was, how far she'd come, in relation to where that book said, the author of the book had travelled, and she recognised that this river was on that map in the book. So she followed along, dismounted from the Shetland pony. She tied it to a tree to continue the little bit of journey she had left, taking her just up into a hill on foot. And she could hear the sound of the flowing water. She could smell that freshness of the water. 
and she could see a cave up in the hills. And as she headed to those caves, she went to the largest one and realized there was a large cave and the others were almost like windows, just allowing more light in. And hanging in the main entrance was a metal container on a chain. And in the breeze, that metal container was moving, swirling around. And there seemed to be some incense or something smelling fragrant coming out of that metal container as it swirled and moved in the breeze. And she noticed a very slight lightheadedness as she walked through that and into the cave. And she turned on a light. She aimed her light around inside the cave, looking at the cave walls. And she could see some drawings on the cave that looked like wild animals and people. And she walked deeper into the cave until she found what looked like a hole in the ground covered over with some wood and so she moved that wood and could see a rope ladder leading down under this cave she shone her light down the cave down that hole she counted that there were ten rungs of the ladder she couldn't hold the light and descend the ladder at the same time so she turned the light off put that in her pocket and began to descend ten nine and she counted her way down those rungs eight seven six going deeper and deeper five four three, two, one, and then she stepped onto the ground in this underground chamber beneath the cave. She got her light back out again, turned around, shone that around, before taking any steps just to make sure everything was safe. She could notice the silence down here, how sound seemed to get lost in the walls with barely any echo. How everything seemed so muted, the air seemed so still. And as she shone that light around. Occasionally, it would sparkle off of things on the walls. And so she went and explored. And she found a few crystals embedded in the dirt of the walls. And she found some stone slabs. And on those stone slabs, she could see markings that looked like writing and she couldn't read that writing. But she had this sense that it was writing and she carried on exploring. And she noticed that this chamber led into a corridor. She followed that corridor until she could hear the sound of running water And she came out into a section of this cave that was illuminated by stringy blue fungus hanging from the ceiling that was giving off the most beautiful blue glow 
illuminating this cave, making that water seem to shine with an electric blue colour. And resting on the water, she could see what looked like a raft. And so she climbed onto that raft and decided to see where this goes. And with a pole that was on the raft, she pushes away from the edge and the raft begins to move with the flowing water and she uses that pole to prod down into the water onto the bottom of this underground river to help steer that raft and she guides and steers that raft along this river and then the river reaches some rapids that seem to head downwards deeper and deeper underground and she uses the pole to keep that raft at a manageable speed as it navigates the rapids and she turns with the rapids and navigates successfully down those rapids the occasional spray splashing up from the front of the raft. Until the rapids smooth out and she finds herself in a lake and there's still that blue glow and she pulls the raft over to the side, disembarks that raft She attaches the raft to the shore. She doesn't know if she'll use that to get back out of the cave at this point, or find an alternative way back up those rapids. But she's hoping she'll be able to find an alternative route than trying to force that raft against the flowing water back to where she came from. But for now, she was curious where this place was. She could see that there was a door down here. And she wondered where that led. And she looked in her book and she could see in the book that it talked about an underground kingdom. An underground kingdom of giants. And she knew that that was impossible. That perhaps there's just a tribe that was encountered that's a bit taller than normal. And that people centuries ago were generally shorter. So she walked through that door, opened the latch, closed it behind her, and was surprised to see what looked like a normal land. She could see a valley, she could see trees, she could see the blue sky and a sun in the sky. And she knew that she'd been traveling down deeper and deeper. And that there's no way that this could be the same place that she came from and so she descended into the valley and as she descended into the valley she noticed that the trees were much taller than she at first realized that everything looked normal from the door it was just a valley to be descended into. And it was only from descending 
that she realized that she was actually very small in this area. The grass was above her waist. Whereas normally the same looking grass would be up to her ankles. And the trees towered way overhead. And she could see a settlement off in the distance and some smoke rising from some of the buildings. And she could see people walking around, people looking like they were working. She could see what looked like a marketplace. So she started heading down towards that settlement. And like with the grass and the trees, as she got closer to that settlement, she could hear the laughter of the people. She could see children running around and playing. But she realized that they towered well above her. That even with those young children, that would normally be about three quarters of her size, she was barely up to their waists. And with the adults, she was barely up to their kneecaps. And at first, she hid, feeling apprehensive and a bit scared. She'd heard stories of giants. Even in the book, she'd read about these giants being scary creatures. But as she hid and observed these giants, so she noticed that they were behaving the same as anyone else. The children were having fun and playing. The adults were working and going about their daily lives. They were chatting, they were drinking. And she looked around her to try and get an idea of where this place was. And it looked like it went on in every direction as far as the eye can see. She couldn't see anything that looked remotely like where she came from. And so she couldn't work out where she was. And she decided to get closer to these giants. So she went and crept to one of the houses. Snuck her way in through what looked like a cat flap, like a small little door space designed perhaps for a pet. And she crept into the kitchen and hid behind a table leg. And she could hear the giants in here just talking with each other and laughing. She couldn't understand what they were saying. But she could recognize the tonality. She could recognize the way that things were being said. As being normal, everyday communication. Just friendly communication, like you would have with any friend or neighbor. And she climbed up onto a chair, climbed up onto the table so that she could get a better look. And while she was on the table, she accidentally made a bit of noise by knocking some cutlery. And so she went and hid behind a teapot. And it was the most beautiful metal teapot. And she hid behind that teapot. 
crouched down, curled up, as she could hear one of those giants walking over to investigate. And when the giant came over, they didn't at first see her. But then they caught a glimpse of her foot sticking out from behind the teapot, and they lifted up the teapot. And in her most charming voice, she just stood up, waved her hand and said hi, and started a conversation. And these giants didn't seem at all scary. They didn't know the language she was speaking, and she didn't understand their language. But they sat down, they watched, while she talked, and they engaged. And she showed things that she had on her. And they showed things back. And somehow they managed to make the communication work. And she tried to explain who she was, where she was from. It didn't seem like they even knew that that door was there. And then one of them went away for a while. Before coming back with an enormous book thudding that book down on the table, flicking through that book, and then pointing at a drawing in the book. And she couldn't read the text that went with the drawing, but she recognised that the drawing was of another small person visiting this land. And that this looked like it was something of a myth for this land. In the same way that to her, giants were a myth. To this giant, small people were a myth. And they offered her some food and she ate that food. And they're incredibly welcoming and kind. And she never knew where this place was. And after a while she left this place. She found her way back to that door. And she decided that she would try and climb up that river up the rapids. It wasn't particularly deep. And so using the pole that came with the raft, she worked her way up through the rapids, found her way back, and out of the cave. And she wandered around those hills, trying to work out where that giant land was. And the only conclusion she could have was that somehow maybe there's some magic portal or something that connects two worlds with that door. And she couldn't find any logical explanation for this. She had to accept that what that adventurer had seen was real and she found her way back to the boat. She tried to tell the crew what she'd seen and they'd laughed, said she must have been drinking or must be just trying to pull their legs and she boarded that ship and they set sail and carried on their journey. And after a few more days at sea, enjoying nights of watching suns set over the sea, 
of watching the moon rise, making the ocean glow with silver sparkles and a cloud of stars overhead. She could see a peninsula sticking out into the ocean. On the end of that peninsula was the tallest, brightest lighthouse that she'd ever seen. And she could see that in the book it talked about a magical lighthouse that at the same time as trying to warn you to keep away from the rocks looks so incredible you feel lured towards it and so she told the crew to only approach in the daylight so as being able to sail safely to that location rather than being lured there. And the next day, just after sunrise, they headed over towards that lighthouse and they could see how beautiful and white that lighthouse was, how the stonework seemed to almost emanate light. And when they got as close to the shore as they could safely get, the woman got into a small boat and rowed the last bit of distance to the shore. And arriving on the shore, the woman went exploring and like many of the locations it seemed to be very overgrown by nature tall trees dense forest or dense woodland vast colorful and beautifully smelling meadows and so she wandered through the meadows, through the woodland. She had to hack her way through. It was so dense. Before eventually coming out in a clearing where she could see this beautiful, sparkling, trickling stream just flowing out from the woodland, down into those meadows. She could see butterflies, bees, birds, all darting in and out of that meadow. And the birds diving into that stream, flapping their wings, washing their wings, poking their heads into the stream, seeming to feel a sense of refreshment in this warm weather. And they seemed to be finding it so refreshing, she felt this sense of thirst and decided to scoop up some of that water, splash it on her face, and then drink a little of that water. And she drank some of that water and could feel that cool, refreshing water passing down through her body. And she was surprised to find that as she drank the water, so it was almost as if her aches and pains were fading away. And so she drank some more and some more as those aches and pains faded. And she felt almost invigorated by that water. And she filled a bottle 
with the water to take with her, and carried on her journey following that stream. And at the end of the stream was a tiny lake, a lake so small it was barely a pond. But it was very deep, and it seemed that that water flowed down to this location, and then must flow deep underground. And she dropped a coin into that pond. And at first she could see the high sun glistening off that coin as it sunk into the water. But then it seemed to keep going into the inky blackness, deep into that hole. And she was curious how far down that went. Then she had a rope. And so she decided to tie a small rock to the end of that rope. She threw that into the hole. And she allowed that to sink as she held on to the rope. And it just kept descending deeper and deeper until she was holding just the very end of that rope. And she had to pull that back out because she didn't want to lose the rope. And so she knew that it was at least deeper than this rope. And she was curious why this water wore away at this location and led to this specific hole. And so she sat beside that pool of water. And as she did, she could see what looked like tiny goats making the most incredible sound. She wondered whether they were baby goats. But they were just so tiny. And then she saw that they had even tinier ones. And then she saw what looked like tiny hippos around some water way off in the distance, rolling into some mud. And she realized that there are a number of mammals on this island, on this location, that seem to be incredibly small. And this wasn't unusual for some places, but she found it intriguing that she'd come from a land of giants to now finding a land of small creatures that look familiar yet unusual. And she decided to carry on exploring. She drank some of that water from her bottle, and before setting off again, she refilled that bottle. And every time she drank, she felt this sense of well-being. This sense that somehow it was almost invigorating through her mind and body. She felt her mind was sharper, her vision was sharper. She felt more physically fit and active. And she didn't know if this was just in her mind. And as she continued to explore, she noticed the strangest thing. She could see this shiny looking stone it was the most incredible thing. It looked almost like 
a perfectly smooth red stone with some black dots on it. And it was about the size that she was. And as she approached, she noticed that it was actually familiar and was taken aback when she realized it was a human-sized ladybird that just seemed to be resting in the grass. And so she approached cautiously and carefully, but accidentally startled it as she got closer and could see the way it moved its shell out the way, inflated and stretched out its wings, almost like giant lace kites. and started to rapidly flap those wings. And then seeing its body rising up, its legs dangling beneath it, and feeling almost like someone's fanning her face, the pressure of the air being displaced by the flapping of those wings, and the almost rumbling buzz of that ladybird taking off and flying off. And suddenly she realized that there were a few different insects like that, that she hadn't at first noticed because they were so out of place, that seemed to have grown extremely large here. And that there was something strange about this land. And she wondered whether it had something to do with that water. She didn't know if she was seeing things because of the water. And she found a space under a tree. She got that book out. She continued to read, and she read about that lighthouse. She read about this strange land here, about the giant insects that she had just dismissed as being perhaps just slightly larger than average. And it didn't say anything about the small animals But it talked about a strange building, a circular stone building here. And that somehow, in that circular stone building, is the reason for the strangeness in this land. And she tried to work out on the map where that circular stone building is. And she had to head back into the dense woodland. And she pushed on through that dense woodland in the direction where that stone building should be. And in the book, it looked like this used to be on the edge of the dense woodland but that woodland has gradually been reclaiming this land over the centuries, as people don't really visit here. And she found that stone building, and it looked like it was the same kind of stone as the lighthouse, that it seemed like the stonework itself almost emanated and glowed light. And she walked around that building and she found a white door. She opened that white door. She walked inside that white door to see just an oval room. And around 
the entire wall were doors. It just seemed to be a room of doors. And yet she knew, having walked around the building to find this door, that this was the only door. And she looked behind herself and saw that the door she had just walked through looked exactly the same as every other door in this room. And she decided, just to be sure, that she would leave a mark on this door. So she got out a crystal that she'd picked up while in the caves. And she scratched on the door a number one, so that she knew which door she came in and which door to leave through. And although she was very confident that this door was the door she'd come in through, and so this door was the door she should leave through, she opened the door just to double check, given that her experiences have been unusual. And when she opened the door, it was the correct door. And she wondered what could be behind the other doors. She expected that behind each of the other doors would just be a wall, because there's nothing else that could be there. And she looked in the book, and the book said that many of the places that they had travelled to were connected with this building almost like taking a map, putting a map on a wall, putting little pins in every location you visited, and then finding a central location and placing a pin there, and then placing a thread between each pin and that central location, and knowing if you head out from that central location, in any of those threads, you'll go to one of those other places. And they even include a drawing that looks very much like that. And she had read it as being a misunderstanding of maps. When the person who'd written this book had described this place as the centre of the world, when she knew that there was technically no real centre of the world. There was a North Pole, a South Pole, and then there was countries, there was continents, and oceans. There wasn't an actual centre to the world. So she assumed that it was just a misunderstanding. Perhaps through being too naive, given how fantastical some of the tales were. And as she went to the first door and opened up that first door, she suddenly felt freezing cold. And she could see snow And she walked through that door and she was cold and shivering, but she wanted to check it out and see what was here. And she could hear the howling wind. She could see snow blowing across the land and she was near the coast and she could see the ice stretched out over the sea. And she walked a little way over that ice. And then she saw the most incredible sight. She saw a narwhal poking its head up out of the water and then splashing back down into the water again. And she thought to herself, 
about those people that have misinterpreted them as somehow being like unicorns or related to unicorns in some way. Or being some other mystical being. And she knew that it shouldn't have been possible for her to be here from walking through that door. And she closed that door behind her as she went back into the room. And she could instantly feel the warmth of this location again that felt so much more refreshing having come in out of the cold. And she opened the next door and was surprised to see that it was night time. She could see the curtain of stars. She could see some shooting stars. She could see that moon in the sky and the moon was at a slightly different angle to what she saw it the previous night. So she knew she must be in a different location on Earth. But here it was still a comfortable temperature and she didn't want to get lost from the door. So she left the door open and she left a light at the door. So that as she walks away from that door, although there's some light in the room, she wanted to make sure she could definitely find her way back. And she could feel herself walking through tall grass. And as she did occasionally, she would disturb plants and see clouds of fireflies launching up into the sky and see the green flickering and dancing of those fireflies in the sky. And then she heard a snort and some loud breathing and could hear some running water and she could see the water with the glistening from the moon and could see a shadowy figure. And so she carefully, quietly approached that shadowy figure, approached that water. And she realized that it seemed to be the head and body of a man but the legs and back of perhaps some kind of animal, almost like a horse. And as they noticed her, they were startled and they jumped back. And again, they seemed to be able to communicate with a complex language but she couldn't understand their language and they couldn't understand hers. But they approached with curiosity and she approached them with curiosity. And as they got near each other, they bowed their head low as if to signal friendship and peace. And so she copied and bowed her head and then they looked back at each other and she held a hand out and they held a hand out and she taught them to shake hands. And they were inquisitive about each other. And when they knew they couldn't communicate with language, they reduced the amount of verbal language they used just making sounds while communicating non-verbally. 
and they led her around to their family. And she saw that there were even more, that there were herds of these creatures which looked very human at the front end and looked almost horse-like for the rest of their body. And she could see the males, the females, the children. And they're all curious about her and they're walking around her curious about how she only seemed to have two legs and they nuzzled and touched at her clothes curious about how she was wearing clothes and then she saw sparkling coming down from the sky and could hear a buzzing by one ear and then by the other ear. And she instinctively tried swatting it away. Before hearing a small voice, a slightly squeaky voice. And realising that it was a small green fairy. And it hovered in front of her and it began to talk. And she was surprised to find that she could understand it. And the fairy explained that they were magic. And being magic, they can communicate in any language. And so they can understand each other. And the fairy said that they can help her to communicate with others just as easily. And the fairy flew off and said, follow me. And so the woman followed that fairy and had to run to keep up. And the fairy went to a small stream. And that stream was bubbling and she could tell that this stream was bubbling because it was a spring. And around the edge of this spring, she could see some glowing mushrooms just illuminating the outside of the spring. And the fairy said to scoop up some of this water and drink some of this water that this water mixes with the roots of the mushrooms. And these mushrooms connect with all living beings. And so by mixing with the roots of the mushrooms, drinking this water will allow you to be able to communicate with all animals. And so she drinks some of that water and the fairy explains that this won't last forever. And so she drinks some of the water from her water bottle as well and then scoops up some of this water in her water bottle, feeling that she may want to try this again later. And then she finds that she can communicate with these animals here, with these beings here. She can learn more about them. And the fairy tells her that there are many realms connected. And that the location she's found is the center of those realms. It's like the hub of those realms, that there are many other portals to those realms that can be found. But a wizard many thousands of years ago had lived out on a remote location, had created a lighthouse, had created a hub connecting to the realms 
so that they wouldn't have to travel to each gateway to the different realms. Instead, they had all the realms where they were. And that centuries ago, another explorer found this location. And she went back into that room and she explored more of the doors. Walking through one door, she found the most beautiful palaces with the most incredible mosaic floors that echoed and reverberated with each footstep seeming to make the most perfect pitch. Lands which had palaces stretching high into the sky. Lands with dragons. Lands with all sorts of creatures that seem mythical to us in our normal world. And she realized that everything that was written down about these myths and legends in these different cultures had a seed of truth that people were just discovering these realms, almost like alternative earths overlaying normal earth, where every possibility is a possibility. And they would pass into another realm, but on their trips they would find their way out. Sometimes a realm would randomly fall into sync with the earthly realm. It would seem almost like a cloud descending on that location. It's almost like someone's played a guitar string and another string has started to vibrate in sympathy. And for a moment, the two realms merge And then you either pass out of that location and are just back in your normal location, like passing out of a bubble, passing through a cloud. Or they go back out of sync with each other again and the realm disappears. And in most cases, you're back in your normal realm. And in rare cases, ships will disappear into the other realms, perhaps never to find their way back. And the woman checked out the different rooms, checked out those different doors. And after visiting many of those realms, She went back through that first door. She found her way back to the shore. She rowed back to the boat. They raised the anchor and carried on their journey. And she knew now that whatever they find for the rest of this journey will probably just be more of the entrances to these realms and that what had been written down hundreds of years earlier was true. They weren't just myths. There was nothing for her to intellectually debunk. She's now realized that she just needed to open her mind to how much there can be out there and the possibilities. And she continued her journey. 
eventually arriving back in her own country, and then spending years writing up a book about her adventures, telling her stories. And now sitting, rocking in that chair, telling her grandchildren, having those children enthralled with her words, captivated by fascinating creatures, lands of giants, dragons, palaces. She takes two copies of her book that she's got beside her. She writes their names in those books. She tells them these are the only two copies of this book. No one ever allowed it to be printed. No one ever believed her. No one ever opened their mind to the possibilities and the wonder of the world. And so she told her story anyway. She printed her books herself, just to pass down in her family, to help these stories continue on, to help the myths and legends continue on into the future, to hope that one day future generations will go off and investigate these things for themselves, will follow the clues in the books, And the children were so excited by being given these books. And then the grandmother said, it's time for bed. She showed them up to their room, settled them down in their beds, kissed them both on the forehead, gave them a big hug, told them that she loved them, turned off the light, and having had a story told, they quickly fell asleep with their minds racing with imagination and wonder, as children do. And with a smile on her face and happy to have shared with her young grandchildren these stories, that for the first time in years, She's been listened to and heard, rather than ignored and laughed at. She sits by a fire. She drinks a warm, comfortable drink. Before turning the lights off, heading to bed herself. And as she begins to fall asleep, She looks over on the nightstand and she can see a little crystal bracelet that she was given in one of those realms that she'd revisited a number of times. It was a realm where she'd met her soulmate. And they maintained a connection through that crystal bracelet as a way of her accessing their realm. And they can visit her in her realm. And she just has to wear that bracelet. And it connects almost like connecting the electromagnetic pulse of her heart that synchronizes with her soulmate and the realms merge and they can see each other, walk towards each other, spend time together. And for years they've shared that magical relationship and every night she looks at that bracelet, reaches over, gently touches 
that bracelet with her fingertips before tucking herself up in bed, pulling her arms in under the covers, pulling the covers up round her neck, and drifting and floating so comfortably and relaxed to sleep. Allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably relax, so I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation, I don't know whether you're going to drift deeper asleep to the sound of my voice, or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you just comfortably drift and flow to sleep, you can just have a sense of a young girl walking through a pine forest. And as she walks through that pine forest, she can notice how tall all the trees are around her. She can smell that pine smell. And as the wind blows a breeze through the forest, she can hear the rustling of the pine trees as the branches rub together. And she can see the occasional dancing shard of light breaking its way down through the canopy to the forest floor. And the gentle sound of birds up high in the trees And she can notice the sound of her footsteps, the occasional cracking of twigs on the floor. And she can feel that breeze on her face. And while she walks through this forest, she has pleasant thoughts in her mind and a pleasant feeling of comfort and peace. A feeling like living here and being in this pine forest just brings a certain connection to nature, where she feels safe and secure. And she follows a dirt path through the pine forest, then turns down another dirt path. She notices the tufts of green moss on the ground, and the dark pine needles overhead, and areas of brown, dead pine needles, just along the edge of the path. And as she follows this path, the path gets narrower as the forest gets thicker and denser. And that increased density reduces the breeze, darkens the forest, softens the sound. And she finds her way to a small clearing in this forest. A small clearing with just a single house. And she walks up to that house And this is her home, so she enters the house. She sees her parents just milling around inside the house. 
She can smell some cooking. And she heads to her bedroom. And she relaxes on her bed. And out of her bedroom window, she can see the back garden, surrounded by the dense pine trees. And with this house here, she's got a view of the sky. And so she can see how blue the sky is during the day. And then the stars appearing at night. And she wonders what other forests are like. She's heard about forests in other countries. Forests of wide, tall trees. Forests of white trees. Forests of broad oak trees. And in her mind she's curious what these different forests would smell like. What the bark of the trees would feel like. And what it would be like to walk through such varied locations. And as she thinks about the difference between one forest and another, relaxing on her bed, she comfortably drifts asleep. And as she drifts asleep, so she begins to hear the sound of circus music. And starts to have this feeling of flashing lights, of multiple colours around her eyes. And that feeling of sensing those flashing lights through closed eyelids. And the music gets louder and louder. And she opens her eyes and finds herself resting on a bench at a fairground. She stands up from the bench and walks towards the different rides. She can see people milling around. She can see children with cotton candy. Children running away from their parents to check out different rides, different amusements. And she's curious about a dark hut at the back of the fairground that looks like a ride that's been shut down. But something about it draws her in. And she walks towards that hut. And it's dark and quiet around that hut. And it's beyond the rest of the fairground. And as she walks out to that hut, so she can hear the rolling sea rolling in under the end of the fairground. She notices how it's sticking out, almost like on a jetty over the edge of the sea. And she reaches that hut carefully leans forward, takes hold of the doorknob, opens that door, hears the door creak and squeak, and she walks in to this hut, and the hut's just lightly illuminated, from the ambient light outside. And inside the hut, 
she notices a twinkling of light and colour. And she sees as she follows the twinkling that there's a room that seems to have no back wall. And she's shocked by what she discovers and excited by what she discovers. She sees that she can look out from this location over the dark nighttime ocean. She can see stars in the sky. She can see the moon in the sky. And she can see what looks like a long, colourful dragon of light with flowing, multicoloured ears, a long snout, a slight smile, the friendliest eye looking at her, a really long, weaving, winding body with two small front legs, two small back legs that are hooked up while it's flying and hovering. And it seems to be moving its body gently to be able to hover there. And she can almost see through this dragon. She can see its whiskers hanging down and flowing with its movement. And as the movement of the body happens, so the whiskers move and flap, almost like ropes hanging from a moving rope bridge. And in a deep, comforting voice, the dragon tells the girl to climb on. And the girl doesn't know how. And she says this. And the dragon's alongside where the girl is standing. And as she looks at the back of the dragon, so she sees what looks like crystal steps appearing and a crystal carriage appearing on the back of the dragon. And she climbs those steps with a clink and a clunk on each step. She walks into that crystal carriage and sits down on a red velvet cushion and then the dragon launches itself off into the sky and she's shocked at how silent this dragon flies and how she can see behind her that the dragon's tail is moving up and down, undulating. How in front of her, the dragon's neck is undulating. But the dragon's managing to keep the movement of where the carriage is. So comfortable and still. And she can feel the breeze as that dragon flies rapidly through the sky. She can feel her hair flowing backwards. And she can hear a twinkling sound from the dragon as it turns, almost as if somehow its whiskers twinkle like wind chimes. 
and she notices that this dragon is flying towards what looks like a distant storm. And the dragon comforts her and lets her know it's all okay. There's nothing to worry about. We're flying above the storm. There's somewhere I want to take you. Something I want to show you. And the dragon flies towards that distant storm. And the girl's surprised that she can see lightning striking the ocean. She can see the bottom of the clouds lighting up in patches. And as the clouds light up, she can see that there's sheets of rain beneath the cloud. And yet, there's no sound, just a sense of comfort from the view. And the dragon flies up above the clouds. And the tops of the clouds are white. And look so soft and comforting. And then she notices that there's a pure white castle up here in these clouds. And the dragon flies her down to that castle. Circles around, wraps itself round and lands in front of that castle. And the dragon says, I'll wait here. Head inside. And the girl climbs off of the dragon onto the cloud. And she feels like she's walking on a fluffy, bouncy castle. She feels like she wants to just lie down, it's so soft. But she walks and bounces her way to the castle. enters that castle and finds that inside the castle the floor is solid, marble and echoey. And the inside of the castle just seems to glow with an almost daylight type of light. And yet, there seems to be nowhere that light is coming from. It just seems to be glowing from everywhere. And in the middle of this castle is a grand old oak tree. And there's a woman stood next to that oak tree. And the girl walks over to that woman. And the woman explains that this is the tree of life. And that this tree of life gives life by seeding the clouds, stimulating rain. And as the clouds spread around the earth, so life spreads around the earth. And that the castle and the cloud phase between reality in this world and a different reality. And that there are actually multiple dimensions of reality. And the girl doesn't understand what she's talking about. This woman says there's no need to understand. It's just the way it is. 
that some things are just the way they are, whether you understand them or not. And then the woman reaches up and grabs some fruit from this tree. And the girl is confused, thinking oak trees don't give fruit. And the woman explains that this tree is a tree of life, and that it's a magic tree, so if you want something, all you have to do is think about it, and it'll produce it. And the girl thinks of the cotton candy that she saw that other child eating. And as she thinks about that, so one of the branches begins to sprout cotton candy and she can smell that as it starts to grow out of that branch, wrapping around the branch. And then the woman reaches up breaks that branch off and hands it to the girl. And then the girl walks with this woman while eating that cotton candy. And the woman walks her through to a library and explains that this girl is the only one who can pass on a very specific message because it needs someone small, someone brave and accepting, someone who isn't phased by the unusual, someone who's happy to accept the reality they see as being real to them. And that this girl, using her inquisitiveness, has demonstrated that she's the one to pass this on. And the woman gets a book and she reads a bit of this book. And she explains that there needs to be a connection between the air, the earth and the water. And that as time has gone on, this connection has been lost. But with this girl's inquisitiveness, now's the time to reconnect the air, water and the earth. And that the dragon can help. And the woman writes something on one of the pages in that book hands the book to the girl, just as she's finishing her cotton candy. And ushers her back out of the castle, telling her the dragon will know where to go. And she heads back to that dragon, climbs back into the crystal carriage. And the dragon asks if she's okay and holding on tight in such a gentle voice before launching off the cloud and swooping down and she notices that she can see that fair and that the dragon seems to be flying very fast out to sea beyond the fair and aiming down towards the sea. And the girl worries about this dragon flying so fast and down towards the sea. And the dragon says, it'll all be okay. You're on my back. You'll be fine. Just stay in the carriage. 
and with barely a splash. The dragon passes under the water. The water rises up around the carriage. And yet none of the water seems to pass into the carriage. And she knows that there were no windows in this carriage. She could feel the air on her face. And the dragon seems to accelerate underwater. And she notices these pulses of water pass by her. And then the girl begins to notice in the deep, dark depths of the ocean what looks like another glowing white building coming into view and she sees that off in the distance deep under the ocean is another glowing white palace and this palace looks different, but it looks like it's made of whatever the same material is. And the dragon lands by the palace. And the girl says to the dragon, but I can't leave your back. Because there's water out there. And the dragon says, it'll all be okay. Just get out of the carriage and you'll be fine. And the girl goes to the side of the carriage. She climbs onto the steps and notices that the water doesn't seem to touch her. She descends those steps to the ocean floor and notices that the ocean floor she's walking on seems to be dry, and that the water seems to be curving around her. And she walks towards this palace entrance. She climbs into the palace. She worries when she opens the door that the water will go rushing into this palace. and wonders how so much water above a palace, if there isn't water in it, isn't crushing it. But she opens the door to the palace, and no water floods in, and she just walks dry into the palace, closes the door behind her. And inside this palace, She sees a woman standing near a pillar of water that seems to be passing all the way up inside the palace, perhaps even out the top of the palace. And in that column of water seems to be a tall coral And she admires how colourful this coral is. And notices the way it seems to sparkle and twinkle. And can see the movement in the coral. And she walks over to the woman. And this woman says, you've got something for me. And she reads from the book. And then she writes something in the book. And she thanks the girl for her help. And she explains that you're going to unite the three realms. And help us to connect again. And the girl doesn't fully understand. 
and she hands that book back to the girl. The girl doesn't look at what's written in the book. She just takes the book and gets told to head back to the dragon. So she heads back out of the palace. Equally as amazed again, how when she opens the door, no water floods in, and as she steps towards the water, it moves perfectly around her, so that she walks totally dry all the way back to that dragon. And as she's walking back to the dragon, she can see the way. It's almost see-through underwater, creating a shimmering of light, pulsing of colour. And she climbs back into the crystal carriage. And rapidly that dragon moves off the sea floor and starts heading back towards the surface. And once it reaches the surface, it explodes out of the water, launching up into the sky. And begins to accelerate faster and faster, well away from where she started. And she has this feeling like it's heading halfway around the world. And it arrives at a location with mountains. And she worries she's going to be freezing cold. She's still only got her purple dress on. And the dragon says it'll all be okay. And the dragon circles one of the high peaks before landing on the snow and she can see there's a cave entrance high up here in the mountains she gets off of that dragon walks through the snow and is surprised to find that she can feel the crunching of the snow beneath her feet she can hear that crunching of the snow beneath her feet. But she can't feel any temperature from the snow beneath her feet. And she walks to that cave. And as she enters the cave and begins to descend, she notices that the more she descends, the closer she gets to some underground light that has a feeling of daylight. And then she finds herself in a vast chamber, and in the middle of that chamber is another white palace. And again, it seems to be made out of the same material that seems to emit light. And she walks to that palace enters that palace and in the centre of this palace she sees this narrow tall mushroom and she can notice the purple patches on the top of that mushroom the purple streaks going down the sides of the mushroom and stood underneath this mushroom she sees a woman. And she walks over to that woman. And the woman says, you've got something for me. And she gets out that book. She hands that book to the woman. And the woman reads some of the book before writing something in the book. And after writing in the book, she doesn't hand the book back. 
she asks the girl to help her. And she gets down onto her knees and she starts digging in the mud beneath the mushroom. And the girl gets down on her knees and helps dig with her hands as well. And as they dig, they get their hands dirty. And she places that book underneath the mushroom. She covers that book over with the mud again. She then waters that location with some water from a pot. And the girl's curious, wondering what has just happened. And the woman says that they've all needed to contribute to that book. And now it just needs to grow and become part of the nature and allow nature to take its course. It's not for their involvement now that this will connect the tree of life which is giving the rain. This will connect the mushroom which churns up soil which helps spread nutrients and the coral and the girl is curious what's going to happen, how it all works. And as she has that sense of curiosity, she begins to see what looks like some precious stones forming in the skin of that mushroom. And she notices light seeming to emanate from those stones, shining off around the room, multicoloured. And the woman explains that this same thing will be happening to the coral, the same thing will be happening to that tree. This is connecting the realms. of the earth, the air, and the water, and connecting the dimensions, that people are so used to the dimensions they live in, they're almost blind to the other dimensions, and yet nature needs all dimensions. And she explains that it may not make full sense. But the world is quantum. And the girl doesn't really understand. And she sees this flash of light come from the mushroom. Almost like a pulse being given off followed by another pulse and another, almost like the mushroom has developed a heartbeat. And the woman says that the same will be happening in the other palaces. And the girl gets told that she can have a gift for her help that she can go into the library here and she can choose one thing to take away with her. And she walks into the library and she can see books floor to ceiling. But something she notices is a bowl with some water. And in that water 
she sees a single cherry blossom just floating on that water. And although she's got the choice of all these books to choose from, she feels drawn to that single cherry blossom. And as she puts her hand in the water and scoops that cherry blossom out of the water, so the cherry blossom begins to turn into a crystal. She finds herself looking at the most beautiful pink and emerald crystal in her hand. And the woman says, great choice, a very wise choice. And the woman takes a pin off of her top. She attaches the pin to that cherry blossom and then attaches the cherry blossom to the girl's purple dress. And she tells the girl to go back to the dragon. And so the girl heads back out of the palace, back up out of the cave. She walks back through the snow to that dragon. She climbs back onto the dragon's back, into that crystal carriage. And the dragon launches from that mountain and seems to accelerate rapidly back around the earth, back towards that fair. And as the dragon arrives back at the fair and silently pulls alongside the building she climbed out of, she climbs out of the crystal carriage, walks down the crystal steps, she turns to look at this dragon, sees its friendly smile, sees its friendly eyes, and the gentle way it moves and floats, the way its whiskers blow in the breeze, like wind chimes, the softness of this dragon, And the dragon tells her that I'll always be in your heart. We'll always be connected. You've done more today than you realise. And you're going to blossom well. And the girl doesn't understand. And in a blink, the dragon launches itself off and disappears off into the night. And the girl walks back through the building, back through that fair, and walks back to that bench. And then she remembers that she thinks she's dreaming. She had totally forgotten about that. It all feels so real. And then a man walks over and says to her, you've been there a while. And he holds his hand out. And in his hand is what looks like a little clockwork mouse. And he winds that mouse up. And it starts twitching its nose. It starts walking around on his hand. And it looks so real in the way it moves. Yet it almost looks like it's made of pieces of wood, little pieces of metal. So intricately done. By someone who clearly understands mechanisms. 
And this person hands her that clockwork mouse. It says, just take a moment to close your eyes. Hold on to that clockwork mouse. And as you hold that clockwork mouse, gently pet that mouse. Comfort that mouse. And as you do, just feel a sense of drifting, floating and falling asleep. And as she listens to his voice and pets that mouse, hearing the cogs gently whirring around, she drifts and floats and falls asleep. And then can feel the comfort, the warmth of her bed. Can notice the warmth of the sun shining through her bedroom window. And she realises that it's now morning. She opens her eyes and she sees that clockwork mouse resting on top of her bed covers, on top of her. And she picks it up almost in disbelief. She winds it again and notices how it moves so real. And then she looks beside her on the bedside table and she sees that cherry blossom brooch and an old book she doesn't remember seeing before and a handwritten letter and she reads that handwritten letter keeping to herself what she read treasuring that knowledge, knowing that as the time is right, she'll read through the book, and she wants to share her experience, but she doesn't know if her parents will understand, and she can see her dad sitting reading a book in the living room, and she can see her mum outside painting. She heads outside into the back garden and her mum's there painting on a large canvas. And she's painting with her fingers picking up different paint and different fingers. And she's blind and just feels the artwork. And as the girl watches for a while, she notices that this abstract artwork that her mum is painting seems to resemble the dream that she'd had. that at the top are clouds and a glow in one side. In the middle are mountains and underneath is underwater. And flying right across the canvas is what looks like almost a translucent dragon. And the girl asks about what was painted and the mother says she doesn't know what she's painted. She's just painting what she feels. That she'd splashed some dots of paint with a paintbrush. She'd smeared some paint. She went with the flow, feeling that paint. And spreading it where... The feeling took her. 
and in her mind she felt like she was connecting with the world in some deep and meaningful way. And the girl began to explain about her experiences. Explaining about the dragon and how she thought at first it was all a dream. And the mother had a bowl of water next to her. And she washed her hands in that bowl of water. And she felt that brooch. And as she touched the brooch, she spoke about how she could feel certain energy from it. How her senses of touch and other senses are so heightened that she's sure she can feel something about it. More to it than just a brooch. And the girl explained about the multi-dimensions, about the connection of the air, water and earth. And the mother just took it all in her stride and smiled at her daughter and said your dad would also understand. And the daughter wondered what it all meant. And the mother said, When you're older, you'll know you'll be painting pictures like this yourself. And you'll be seeing that dragon again. And you'll be discovering more. And there's more for you in the future. And that day the girl went out, appreciating the world around her on a deeper level, curious about whether the dragon is out there somewhere, or whether it's just on whatever place she went in her dream, whether that was the real same world as she's in now, or a different world. From what her mum and dad had said, it sounded like it was probably the same world. She just accessed a different dimension. And that night, she read a little bit of that book. And she could smell from the pages of that book. The most beautiful, perfumey smell. She had this sense that somehow that smell was being set up to let her know about future events and future adventures. And as she rested that book in her arms and was gazing at the mouse beside her, she drifted and floated with a smile on her face, comfortably, and relaxed asleep. So, just take a moment to allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, you can begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, so I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation in the background, you can allow yourself to comfortably drift asleep. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. But as you drift asleep, you can have a sense of two twins on a boat. And they're out on their first trip alone together. And these two twins, they've just turned 18. And for their 18th birthday, they're going out 
across a piece of ocean to an island. I'm going to camp on that island and spend some time proving how independent they are. And so, as they travel on that boat, they can hear the wind in the sail, the sound of the waves against the sides of the boat. They can notice what the sky looks like, feeling the breeze against their faces. And they arrive at the island, carefully moor up the boat at a jetty. And they take their belongings off that boat, walk down the jetty onto the island. And it's quite a large island, but there's no one here. And off on the horizon, they can see the shoreline, the mainland. And as the sun passes across the sky, and the afternoon sets in, gets later and later, so they find a space a little way from the shore just on the tree line to set up camp. And they find that almost everything they do is in sync with each other. They don't know whether they believe in telepathy or not, but they sometimes feel like they probably have some kind of telepathic connection. When one does one thing, the other knows what to do at the same time. And they frequently think they know what each other's thinking. And so they set up a reasonably large tent, big enough for the two of them to sleep comfortably in that tent, with plenty of space to walk around in the tent. And they set up that large tent, set up the beds in that large tent. They make that tent so cosy, so comfortable. And they can hear the breeze blowing, making the sides of the tent gently wave and move. They can smell the fresh sea air blowing in through the entrance of the tent. And the first thing they do once the tent's all put up and their beds are made is they lie down on their beds and instantly start to feel like just relaxing for a moment, taking in the beginning of this experience. That kind of relaxation you feel after you've done a task. Or you've just made a bed and you just want to lie down for a moment. with that sense of achievement, that sense that you deserve this. So they just relax there for a bit, not talking to each other, but just listening to the sounds outside the tent, the sound of the sea lapping on the shore, the sounds of birds among the trees behind them, and the sound of the wind. And then as that sun 
gets lower in the sky and begins to set. So they decide to go out onto the beach, just a short few steps from the entrance to the tent. Set up a campfire, place some comfortable chairs near that campfire and cook themselves some food and have a drink. With the dancing light of the campfire and the sight of the setting sun. and that crackling sound of the campfire. And as they cook and eat their food, so they enjoy the smells of that food. They laugh and joke and enjoy this first night And then notice how the sound of the sea lapping on the shore changes slightly as night falls. How the sound almost sounds broader with a slight echo to it. And they walk barefoot down to the water's edge, through that soft sand, through the dry soft sand as they approach the water, and then noticing that sand become firmer and cooler as it becomes damper the closer to the water they get. Then having those waves gently lap on the shore, roll in, tickle their feet, and then roll back out again, pulling that fine sand out over their feet, through their toes. And they stand on the water's edge, side by side, gazing out towards where the horizon would be, and they can't see the horizon because the horizon is as dark as the sky. But they can have a sense for where it is because they can see where the stars end. And out here on a deserted island the quilt of starlight above them is twinkling so bright they can see colours in the sky. They can see more stars than they've ever seen. And they feel a sense of scale gazing up like that sky must be so large. They walk back up the beach a little bit, lie down on that soft sand, lying side by side, just staring up at the sky, hearing those waves rolling in further down the beach, and just seeing those stars arching overhead, noticing the occasional shooting star whiz and fizz across the sky, sometimes green, sometimes red, sometimes blue, sometimes the most pure white. And 
and they find themselves naturally falling into conversations of a philosophical nature, wondering whether there's any other life out there, wondering if other life out there is doing similar to them here, gazing up at the night sky, wondering whether any other life is out there. They wonder whether there's any alien spaceships flying around out there. They wonder whether in the future mankind will encounter aliens, what that would be like, how that would change things for humanity. They wonder whether mankind has ever met aliens in the past and what they would have thought of those aliens. They discussed how in the past mankind probably would have thought they were gods coming down from the heavens, landing in balls of fire. and then leaving in these roaring balls of fire. And they found that there was something about lying on a beach, feeling calm, relaxed, gazing up at how large the universe is, arched overhead, that seems to encourage a sense of wonder and conversations of wonder. And that those conversations and that sense of wonder can give a sense of perspective. And really show how small you are in the universe. And their conversation turns to, what if there is no other life out there? And the importance that would place on humanity to preserve the life that's here, to make sure to look after the life that's here, to protect the planet, if that's all there is. And if it isn't all there is, then a focus on going and meeting more life would be an incredible thing for the future. And after a deeper conversation than they've had in years, they head back to the tent. And they sit just outside the tent for a while as that fire burns down to embers. And as the fire burns down, so it starts crackling faster, a bit like cereal in the morning. And then that subtle glow and that warmth begins to fade. And their feet are fully dry now. So they rub off the sand, head into the tent. They settle down in their beds. They continue their conversations, snuggled up comfortably in their beds. With torchlight glowing around them. That sound of the ocean outside. feeling so calm and so relaxed and they drift and float comfortably asleep 
and the next morning they awaken early to the rising sun, the sounds of birds around them. They feel so alert and full of energy. They leave the tent. They gaze out over the daytime view. Noticing the difference again in the sound of that sea. And their plan is to explore the island. They're going to walk to the river that will take them inland to the centre of the island. And they'll hike to the centre of that island. during the day and in case they need it they've got themselves some hammocks they can hang in the trees that come with small tent coverings that almost create a tent for one a bit like a cocoon and so they set off towards the river, walk along the edge of that river, heading in towards the centre of the island, and they carry on their conversations as they walk along the edge of that river, and they can hear the river lapping gently against the sides of that river bank. And around the river, the forest gets denser and denser, the more inland they go, and the easiest route to take is to skirt that forest and keep following the river. And this river is a tidal river. The sea water flows in and fresh water flows out. And as the sea rises and falls through the day, so the river rises and falls. And a wave at the front of that pushes down the river. And after some time, they find their way to the source of the river, to a natural spring. And it seems very small and unassuming. And yet this small looking spring pushes out enough water to push back the sea. To flow that fresh water down towards the ocean. And they head up, away from the edge of the river, up slightly into the forest. They stop for something to eat. And then one of them gets out a book, and in that book is a folded map. And they look on that map and they see that they're almost at the location of something they really wanted to try and find. They'd heard that there was a chest buried here. They didn't know what was in the chest. But growing up, their dad had kept on talking about a chest on this island. And from his stories, they'd worked out where they thought it might be. And they didn't know if he was telling the truth or just telling bedtime stories. But they enjoyed the idea of one day 
trying to find out and see what this treasure is if it exists. And so after having something to eat, they find that location they've marked on the map. And they try and see if there's any giveaway signs, anything that might let them know where that chest might be. And they look around them and they notice that generally the trees are very dense. But there's one area where they can just see slightly more light seeming to shine through the trees above. And so they wonder if maybe there's a bit more of a clearing in that area. They think it's a long shot, but they decide that they'll go and check out that area. So they cut through the forest. And as they do, they can hear the rustling leaves overhead as the wind blows a breeze. They can see the dancing shards of light as the sun manages to occasionally burst through the moving leaves. And they reach that clearing. And they get a little camping shovel out of one of the bags. They scrape the topsoil off, they scrape some of the leaves off, some of those twigs off. And they take a look down at the clearing to see if there's any height difference, if there's anything that might give away that something's under the ground. And they notice that some of the, what's growing on the ground isn't quite as thick in one area. And they wonder whether maybe that's because there's something quite shallow under that area. So things can't dig their roots down quite the same there. There isn't quite so much moisture there. So they go to that space. And they dig down carefully. Removing that soil. Until they hear a knock. And they realise they've reached something. And excitedly they carefully nudge down with the spades. Working out the dimensions. Clearing the soil from above that. clearing the soil from around the sides of it slightly. And then together they reach in, lift that out, and place it down next to the hole. And they see that that chest is locked. And they don't know how they're going to get into it. They've not got a key. And they've not got any other clues. They decide that what's best would be to take that chest back to the camp where they could work on it some more. Maybe they could pick the lock. So they start carrying that chest back but decide after a while that it's a bit too heavy. So they stop and decide to see if they can pick the lock here. And they start trying to pick that lock, carefully listening to the lock while moving the workings inside the lock up and down until they hear a slight click and then moving to the next bit inside that lock until they hear a slight click again. 
and then holding that bit in place and moving to the next bit. And then that lock pops open and they remove the lock. And with a slight squeak, they open that lid and they look inside the chest. And inside the chest, they can see an old book. And next to the old book is a small little box. And then what looks like a letter or something inside an envelope. And then next to that, on both sides, are some bars of gold. And they realise that those bars of gold must be what was making this so heavy. And they pick up those bars and they handle them. Feel how smooth those bars of gold are. And they put them back down into the chest. They pick up the small little box and they open it and inside they see a golden key and that golden key is on a chain and so one of the twins puts that golden key over their neck and just hangs that over their neck and then the other one looks in the envelope. And when they try and read what's written on the paper, they find that it seems to just be symbols, it doesn't seem to make sense. And they turn it over and they both take a look. And the way it's written looks like it's meaningful, it's just that they don't understand the meaning. And then they take out that old book. They can notice how all the pages seem to be almost like they were individually just torn bits of paper turned into a really old book, looking hundreds of years old. And they can't really understand much of the writing in this book either. But they try and look through, they can see there are some illustrations in this book. And they decide that they want to take the book, want to take the key, and want to take the letter with them. They don't feel they need the gold. They want the puzzle, they want to solve this puzzle. So they return that chest, they cover it over. And now, not carrying quite so much, they set off back to their camp. And back at the tent, they look through that book, they look at the letter. And they try and compare the two and see if they can work out any kinds of patterns. And they happen to have mobile phones with them. And so they try and look up some of the different symbols, see if they can find any clue as to what any of this might mean. They start to find some references to certain symbols. And so, in a separate notebook, they start writing down what those symbols mean. And they notice that these symbols mean a different language. So they keep having to use a translator to work out what this language means as they translate a few words at a time. 
And not only is it a different language, but it's an old version of that different language. And they realize that this book, as they get more and more of the words, seems to be almost like a book of spells, a book of healing. It describes itself as a book that you can heal people by reading to them, by having them enter some kind of a trance state, and then reading these spells to them. And if they follow along to these spells, then healing can occur. And that you can say these spells to yourself, allowing that healing to occur for yourself. And they decide that they're going to need plenty of time to work out and decipher the entire book. And the letter, they discover, is about the book. And it tells them that there's even more for them to find. That this was where they'd hidden the last of their treasure. And it talks about how this was the last stand of some witches. That witches became hunted down. That instead of being appreciated for the healing work that they did, people became scared of them. So they turned the last of their money into gold, took it out to this island, placed their book of spells in this location. And there's a building on the mainland and the key is for that building. And this is where they hid their witch's past and decided to put all that behind them and just fit in, that people were too scared to be ready to accept help from those who could heal. And the twins talked about how it would be a bit like people with greater knowledge, like aliens, landing and trying to share that knowledge. And if the knowledge is too advanced for them, or seems too alien for them. Then some people that can scare them. They can make them feel anxious and worried, perhaps even uncertain. And it's human nature to identify risks. And some people can get stuck on a spiral of identifying the risks without stepping off that spiral to take an objective look from a place of calm and peace. And that seems to be what happened here hundreds of years ago. And so the twins settled down for another night knowing they're heading back to the mainland in the morning. And they drift and float comfortably and relax to sleep. And the next day, they pack everything away onto their boat. They set back off towards the mainland. And as they travel, back to the mainland. They talk about how this was a great trip to make on turning 18. 
was an exciting trip to make. And it's a trip that's going to continue to teach them something new with this book. A trip that's going to allow them hopefully to find the building that key opens. And so they head back to the mainland, head home, drop everything off at home, say hello to their parents, freshen up. And then they carry on deciphering that book and the letter. And after deciphering many of the spells in that book, they realise that there's an address. And it's not an address that makes much sense now. But they know from the history of the area that it made sense once in the past. And so they look up where that address would have been. And later that day, they travel off to that address. They jump on their bikes. And they cycle some distance turning into some woodland, cycling through the woodland, passing through a meadow, heading out into a more rural area, cycling down what's barely a road. They pass a field with the most beautiful white horse, They pass a field of sheep. They keep cycling where there's barely any houses. And they'd planned on trying to get back before the sun set. But now we're aware that they probably won't. They let their parents know that they are okay, but they're going to be home a bit later. And they turn down a dirt track, down into what looked like a deserted, perhaps a farm. They didn't know exactly what was going to be down this dirt track. They could notice the low fog as the evening set in, it was hanging over the fields around them, occasionally crossing that dirt track as it escaped from the fields. The way it parted as their bikes went through that fog. They could see fireflies among the trees. and the way their backsides glowed even more in the white fog, creating glowing patches of fog. And apart from the sounds of their bikes, there was just silence. There'd be the occasional sounds of crickets, But then as they approached, they would go silent as well. And sometimes there'd be the sound of movement in the sky. Perhaps a bird flying out of a tree. Maybe some bats flying overhead. And eventually they arrived at a rundown property. Didn't look like anyone had lived here for years. The roof on one side of the property had caved in. The walls had half caved in on that side of the property. 
on the other side of the property was still standing and looked structurally okay. And around this property was a low, dense fog. And the girls got their mobile phones out and the torches on their phones. Walked into this property. And started exploring in the property. And they found a door against a wall. And they tried the key in that door. And as they put that key in the door and they twisted that key, so it sounded like there was a click and a clunk. And then a winding sound, almost like clockwork. And then the door opened. They could see some steps going down. And so they followed those steps down deep under this property. And they walked down those steps. And they found themselves in an underground chamber and were surprised at the size of this chamber. And they started exploring. They could see different belongings. And they imagined these belongings probably belonged to these witches. And they found some records, really old newspaper articles that were more like just sheets of paper, not like a newspaper that they're used to. And from everything they've deciphered and what they learned of the language they realised that some of what was written was diary entries of these witches. And then there were these newspaper clippings, these kind of newspaper pages that seemed to be in Old English about these witches, showing that people of the time were fearful of them and they'd kept these different pages, these different articles. And they found many other items that showed that these witches were just like anyone else. They obviously just knew how to help heal people. They knew how to communicate in a way that stimulated healing in others. And then as one of them were exploring, they touched a brick that looked like it was sticking out slightly. They just had that instinctive feeling of wanting to push that brick into place. But when they did, the wall slid open, revealing a secret passage. And they looked at each other and decided to explore that secret passage. And it was a narrower passage, but perfectly tall enough for them to walk through. Just like walking along a normal corridor. And at the end of the corridor, they noticed that it opened out into a room of mirrors and their lights bounced off all those mirrors. They could see themselves in those mirrors. 
and there was a seat right in the middle of them. And one of them sat down on that seat. And they could see on a silver plaque on the ground. A sign saying to look inside yourself, to see yourself. And so they sat there and they looked at themselves and they could see as they relaxed their vision themselves in the mirrors at the side. They could see themselves in the mirror in front. They had a sense of themselves in the mirror overhead. And then the other one came and sat down and both twins perched on that chair. And they wondered what this room was all about. And they shone their light around the mirrors. But to properly see themselves, they had to aim the light diagonally down. So that it would bounce around the mirrors and just begin to illuminate the room rather than bounce strongly straight back at them. And as they gazed into those mirrors, both sat there together. One of them got that book out and started looking through the spells and then picked a spell and said, I think we should read this one while we're here about good fortune for the future as we've just turned 18 and so the other twin got the translated version in the notepad flicked to that page and together they started reading that spell out loud and while they read, so they noticed the way that that sound seemed to reverberate around this room, almost like the spell was bouncing off the mirrors back at them. And as they read, and they fell into a comfortable rhythm of reading, so the strangest thing happened. The light from their phones, almost seemed to turn into colours of the rainbow reflecting around those mirrors. There was a rainbow of coloured light reverberating in this room. And they continued comfortably to read. And that light continued to pulse and reverberate stronger and stronger until all of a sudden it was as if the room didn't exist the light reverberated and pulsed stronger and stronger and stronger until it all became white light again getting brighter and brighter and then it turned into the blue sky of day the most beautiful country garden, trees around the outside of the garden, the sounds of birds, the warmth of the sun on their face. And as they looked around themselves, they noticed it was as if they were sat on a bench in this country garden. They could see a vegetable patch off at the back of this garden. They could see butterflies, and other insects going about their business and could see birds hearing those birds. They could see the most beautiful roses just swaying in the breeze. And some of those roses were so close they could touch 
those waxy petals. And they looked around themselves in astonishment, curious at what had happened. They were only two thirds of the way through the spell. And now they seem to be here. And they can see an oak tree standing tall at the end of the garden that looks like it's been there for an age. So they walk together down this garden, still wondering how they got here and where here is. They reach that oak tree, ran their hands around the bark, noticing how real everything in this garden feels wondering how they can both be having this experience. And they could see out the back of the garden a meadow. And in that meadow they see someone walking, a basset hound. They gaze up and see a bird of prey on an updraft of warm air, just circling gently high above that meadow. They see some squirrels in the trees, climbing, weaving their way around the trunk of the trees. And they notice they can't hear any cars or any other people. It seems to be a very natural environment. And they look back towards where they've just walked. And they see the back side of a beautiful cottage. With the back door open onto this country garden. But as they look back, so they notice the occasional flicker and movement. And they carry on reading that script. They carry on reading that spell. And as they read, so the experience continues to unfold around them. This feeling of comfort. Both thinking this is the future we want. To live somewhere beautiful. Somewhere natural somewhere away from the hustle and bustle of busy cities. And they realise that this is a representation of a possible future of theirs. They catch a glimpse of themselves in a pond in the garden as they gaze down and see a frog jumping into that pond. They notice the gnomes fishing in that pond. And as they see themselves, at first they wonder if they saw what they thought they saw. And so they look closer as that water becomes stiller. And they realise that they definitely both look older and that this is a representation of their future. And they continue reading that spell. And as they reach the completion of that spell, they sit back down on that bench. And then they just wait and observe the world around them, feeling that this experience is somehow transformative internally for them, feeling this connection with this place. And then while they remain still, so this reality fades, 
they can see those mirrors again. The room becomes darker with just the lights from the phones illuminating, bouncing off those mirrors. And they realise that something about being in this room allowed the experience to be more real than perhaps just having the experience of listening to a spell. And that together they had that experience as a shared experience. And they turned and left this room, walked back down that secret passage, pressed that brick again as that passage closed. Walked out of this room, back out to the main building. And when they reached the main building, they saw an elderly woman stood there and they were startled for a moment before seeing her friendly smile. And she said that she'd been hanging around all this time for these twins to arrive. She said that one of the spells allowed one of them to remain alive in this location, connected to this property, for the time when the right people arrive, to take the torch into the future, and that the two twins are those people, destined to carry that magic forward. And then she handed them both a small bracelet they both put the bracelet on each, and as soon as they did, so the property started twinkling and sparkling, lights started dancing all around them, a swirling, twinkling, sparkling cloud of light started emanating from their feet, up around them, around the woman. And as it did, so it was as if it was drawing the fog into the property, spinning that white fog, illuminated by the sparkling, twinkling light, and a slight hum. And it was as if the woman, who they'd just seen in front of them, vanished and disappeared into that fog, almost as if she became part of that fog, as it circled around them, getting lighter and lighter, twinkling more and more, with each twinkling light illuminating the fog. And then as that fog began to clear, so they noticed something incredible. That while the fog was clearing, so there was a light on in this room. And as it continued to clear, the walls looked white and newly painted. And they noticed that this whole room looked brand new. And they walked through to the next room, and the next room, and they opened doors, and it was as if this entire place had been rebuilt by that fog. And then on a work surface in the kitchen, they saw a handwritten note, just saying, home sweet home. Happy birthday.
and they wondered what that meant. And then as they walked out of the property to take a look from the outside, they could see that the garden had been done up, that everything was still glowing, although it was night time, everything around the property was glowing, as if there was light just illuminating this area. They could see that everything was being manicured, that the hedges were no longer overgrown, the garden was no longer overgrown. And as they walked around the other side of the property, they noticed the back garden and that it looked just like the back garden they had just seen. And then back round the front again, hanging on the door, were two keys and a tag on each key with each of their names on the tag. and a letter confirming that this was their home. And they didn't know what to make of this. And they headed back on their bikes as that property dimmed behind them, wondering how to explain all this to their parents. They cycled all the way home, noticing how the fog had lifted, and it was a clear night. And on arrival home, it was getting very late. They headed into the house, thinking they'd probably have to just sneak to bed so as not to wake anyone. But as they walked in, so they saw their mum and dad stood there with tears in their eyes, saying how proud they were of them as young adults who they're going to become. And then the dad explains that he'd always known about this experience about what was going to happen today. That he was brought up being told the stories about the future and about his role in presenting the ideas and telling stories as they grew up to encourage them to explore. And that for generations those stories have been passed down for the time when the next set of twins are born in the family, and that it will be that set of twins that will take hold of the property that the previous set of twins in the family used to own. And he knew when they went out and said they were going to be late home, and when they went exploring after visiting the island, that they'd obviously found and worked out what they needed to work out. Then the dad got out a book that outlined some of the family history and they sat for many hours learning about those twins hundreds of years ago. about their abilities and about how that was passed down through generations and recounted through generations until now and that they knew that whenever they're ready they've got a home they can move into if they're happy to continue to share that home and they've got somewhere that's the family home. And that night, the girls went to bed. 
and as they lay there in bed with the moonlight shining in the window, and that curtain just blowing ever so slightly, with that window being slightly open, as that cool breeze just gently blows in across their faces. They talked about the experience, about the book, about the future, as they drifted and floated comfortably, asleep. And while they slept, they knew they would wake with the most wonderful future ahead of them, with purpose, feeling a sense of security, knowing they've got the security of somewhere to live, the security of such loving and kind parents. and security in many other ways. And they drifted and floated comfortably and relaxed asleep. 